Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is story about what if before Naruto birth, Minato had promised his marriage to the noble clan part 1 before I start, please do support for more amazing content and comments for part 2, do consider to subscribe my channel and share my video to your friends and check out the description as well, let's start the video. There was a tense atmosphere permeating Taki as the village hidden in the waterfall played host to the peace talks between Iwa and Konoha. Chief Jonin Shibuma sat at the negotiation table with the Sandame Tushikage sitting to his left and the newly appointed Yandame Hokage sitting to his right. Observing the three were aides from all three countries. Theoretically Shibuma was supposed to be an unbiased mediator, but in actuality he wanted to cut whatever deal he could to end the war. Waterfall country had been caught in the crossfire of the Third Shinobi War, although not as badly as other countries like Rain, and needed the peace. Shibuma glanced at both cages and then began to summarize the current draft of the peace treaty. Currently, the terms of the treaty are as follows. Earth country will pull back from the areas of grass country and waterfall country, except for those lands that were once part of ash country, satisfying earth country's claim to the lands of that defunct country. In return, earth country agrees that all lands that once made up ash country, including the lands they held before hostilities began, are to be demilitarized for 30 years. For your villages specifically, you've agreed to each recognize a zone of avoidance. Unless on official diplomatic missions or by approval of Village Cage, no Iwa Shinobi is to come within 40 kilometers of Konoha, and no Konoha Shinobi is to come with 20 kilometers of Konoha. There were further stipulations in the treaty in progress, but they were technical points that most people, including both cages, wouldn't pay much attention to. Anoki frowned as he listened to Shibuma continue to drone on about minor points in the treaty. At first glance the treaty seemed to give Earth Country, and therefore Iwa, many improvements over their pre-war situation. However, such a view did not factor in the power Iowa had during its high point in the war. Just a year ago, all of Waterfall and Grass along with significant sections of fire had been occupied by Earth. But then, Minato Namakas developed his Horatian and proceeded to slaughter Iowa Shinobis and Earth Country soldiers. The newly instated Yandame Hokage was the sole man responsible for reversing Iowa's early victories in the war. Although Inoki didn't want to admit it, the only reason why he was able to extract so much from the peace talks was because Minato was only one man and Iwa still had more soldiers than Konoha. But, that would change in the future as Iwa's spirings had discovered that Minato was secretly married to Kishina Yuzumaki, a formidable shinobi in her own right. Minato probably had kept his marriage a secret in order to prevent Inoki from finding out about it. The Sandame Tsuchikage could appreciate the sentiment, but the possibility of Minato founding a clan of shinobi of his caliber was frightening to Inoki. Something needed to be done to neutralize such a threat, and that something had to be something that would not lead to further troubles for Iowa. Assassination of either Minato or Kishina was out of the question. Trying to get to either would be risky even under ideal circumstances, and that wasn't considering how difficult taking either of them out would be. Furthermore, the fact that Kishina was supposed to be pregnant meant that both ninjas would be on high alert and that the Namaki's family's rise as a prominent ninja clan was close at hand. Suddenly an idea came to Inoki causing him to grin. I have a new condition to add to the treaty. Both Minato and Shibuma wearily turned to look at the grinning Tsuchikage who started to explain his proposal. These current arrangements in the treaty are all very good. However, the treaties ending the first and second great shinobi wars were also very good for everyone. Paper isn't that strong of a binder when something new pops up and then we all go to war again leaving our families venerable. Minato's eyes narrowed in response to how Inoki emphasized families and looked at him. The Hokage instantly knew that the Tsuchikage was stating that he knew about Kishina and the child Minato's wife was carrying. Two questions immediately came to Minato's mind. How did Iwa find out and why was Inoki letting slip this valuable information? But Tsuchikage had to know that Minato would redouble security in Kanoha to root out Iwa's spiring, now that he knew how serious it was. There was no reason for Inoki to risk something as valuable as a competent spiring, unless he was going to get something extremely valuable in return. The only question was. What was Inoki after? There was silence for a few seconds as Inoki allowed Minato to stew over what he had said so far. Once the information had its desired effect Inoki continued. We need something more permanent than paper to solidify this peace treaty and ensure that bad blood does not fester between Iwa and Konoha. After all, this whole war was only business. Therefore, I propose a standard marriage agreement between the yet-to-be-born child of the Yandame Hokage and Kashina Yuzumaki, with one of the heirs of the Tenjuan clan. Such a union would be an enduring symbol of the past being left in the past would it not. It took a supreme effort of will on Inoki's part to keep from grinning like a madman at Minato. At the same time, Minato was using all of his willpower to keep from lashing out at Inoki. Both cages knew that Inoki had Minato where he wanted him. 
If this agreement went through and Kashina had a daughter, then Minato wouldn't be able to fight Iwa with his daughter being on the opposite side. If this agreement went through and Kashina had a son, the boy's wife would effectively keep him from raising his hand against Iwa. If Minato refused the agreement he made Konoha look unreasonable, which would cost the village prominent customers. If Minato tried to get Inoki to table that idea by offering concessions in other areas of the treaty, he not only made Konoha look bad, but also increased Iwa's power. No matter what happened, Konoha was put in a tight spot. Minato closed his eyes for a minute as he carefully weighted each and every option available to him. Finally, the Hokage opened his eyes and said, I am willing to agree to you conditioned Suchikage. However, I want a provision in the treaty to ensure the safety those involved in this marriage agreement. The lateral, if you will, Inca's disgruntled elements of our villages try to take matters into their own hands. I know that there are many in Iowa would like nothing more than to attack my child, and I also know that there are those in Kanoha who do not like the main founding clan of Iowa. Therefore, both Iowa and Kanoha should hold up their scrolls of forbidden jutsus to ensure the couple's safety. Should ninjas from one village attack the other village's member in this marriage union, the offending village will forfeit their scroll in recompense. Do you find this agreeable Tsuchikage? Inoki frowned and considered his options for dealing with Minato's unexpected comeback. Either he could reject Minato's stipulation which would lead to the whole arraigned marriage plan being scrapped, or he could agree and put his village's most valuable jutsus on the line. I accept the conditions to the marriage agreement between the future Namika's child and either Asuka or Fubuki Tanjounin that the Honorable Hokage has requested. Effectively neutralizing the future Namika's threat was much more important to Inoki than worrying about the risk to Jutsus he wasn't about to endanger by breaking the treaty and could be stolen by Kanoha via the Achihas. Minato bowed his head and softly said, make the addition to Treaty Shibuma. The Hokage knew that the Tsuchikage had called his bluff to try and get out of the marriage contract. But, Minato took comfort in the fact that at least his child would not have to worry about threats from Iwa, thanks to the collateral and the marriage agreement. Minato only half focused on the wrap-up of the discussion as he mentally compassed two letters. One letter was for Kashina so that she could blow off some steam before he got back to Kanoha and thus wouldn't kill him. The second letter was for his child explaining why he had stuck the child into an arranged marriage. Kashina Namikas, it made no sense to keep the illusion that was still in Yuzumaki, stood in her kitchen making carrot with some saffron seasoning Raymond. As she was stirring the pot, Kashina looked down at her bulging stomach. What is it with you and Raymond little one? I get that you like Raymond, but please, can't you let mommy eat something besides these noodles? The Namikas matriarch felt her unborn child gently kick her side. She quickly rolled her eyes and then sighed. I guess I should take that as a no. Oh all right little one, I'll let you pick the menu for now. However, don't get used to it. Overall, Kashina was extremely happy with how things were going in her life. The war was over, she had a great husband that she could publicly admit to having, and her first child according to the doctors was growing healthily. Nothing, not even the looming arraigned marriage for her child, could dampen Kashina's mood. Without warning, Kashina's finely honed danger sense went off causing her to dive away from the pot or the kitchen knives, taking care to ensure that her child was protected during the dive. It was a good thing that Kashina dived when she did because seven shurikens came flying where she had been standing. Training kicked in for Kashina as she automatically grabbed the knives were waiting to be cleaned, pumped as much wind chakra as she could into the knives and threw them at the wall. The chakra-enhanced cooking utensils cut right through the wall headed straight towards where the shuriken came from. As the knives were flying, Kashina pulled out the biggest knives in the kitchen, taking care to ever so slightly slice the tip of her pinky on one of the knife edges. She then wiped the bleeding digit across an inconspicuous seal on her belt to alert Minato. That done, Kashina hurriedly dashed towards the other side of the kitchen towards the pantry. The fiery Kanoichi hurriedly opened the pantry and hit a hidden switch, activating a hidden rotating door that carried her into a small room, no bigger than a small closet. This secure room was one of several that had been secretly added to the Namika's house by Minato when he found out that Kashina was expecting. These secure rooms were so small inside that Kashina could only stand, however, they covered in seals enhancing their durability to the point where ever young Kakashi's Yadori or Minato's Rasengan couldn't cut them. Now that Kashina was inside, she didn't have to worry about her or the child's safety and could just wait until Minato let her out once the threat was taken care of. Hiding like some cowardly princess while her man took care of whoever was attacking her frustrated Kashina to no end as she was not that kind of woman. But, for her child's sake Kashina was glad to be out of the fight. Soon enough, the door to the safe room was opened by Minato standing in the doorway with his eyes radiating concern. Are you okay Kashina? Is our child safe? Kashina nodded her head and practically threw herself into Minato as she started crying. We're fine. It's just that, I've never been so scared in all my life. Why would anyone attack me? Iwa wouldn't risk their scrolls, and they already have our child's hand given to a lead clan. 
At this point, Kishina devolved into a sobbing mess. She was a highly trained Kanoichi, but she was also an expecting mother who just had an attempt on her and her child's life. Minato carefully hugged Kishina and softly whispered into her. Everything is alright dear. You and our child are safe. Heck, you killed three of the six attackers with those kitchen knives you threw. Everything is alright. I promise you dear, I'll get the one I left alive for questioning to tell me who instigated this attack. Minato's eyes hardened as a deadly edge came to his voice. I'll then find who's ever responsible and make sure they die in the most painful way I can find or invent. All the clan heads of Kanoha's main ninja clans and representatives of the civilian guilds were gossiping among themselves, wondering why the Hokage had called for a full court assembly. As a feudal lord under the fire daimyo, the Hokage ruled Kanoha with absolute authority. If he felt like getting advice on an issue, he'd hold a council session with representatives that he felt would give him useful advice. Assembling the full court of Kanoha rarely happened, and only on matters of extreme importance. Most edicts or rulings that the Hokage made were made known to the public through the newspapers. The last time a full court had been held was when Minato ascended to the position of Yandame Hokage so that everyone could make their oaths of allegiance to him. The murmuring abruptly ended when Minato walked into the room wearing his full Hokage regalia and sat down on the chair prepared for him. Everyone assembled in the great meeting hall shivered slightly as they sensed a barely contained rage within Minato. Those who personally knew the usually calm and cheerful man wondered what could have enraged Minato so. Minato looked down upon his assembled subjects and solemnly spoke up. To Kanoha I swear my loyalty and service. To the Hokage I vow obedience to serve Kanoha. May my life be forfeit if I so break this oath. That is what each and every one of you swore when you became adults and which you reaffirmed upon my taking her Asharama's chair. I have summoned you all here today because there are those among you who have broken this oath. Bring out the condemned. The side door opened and a troop of Anbu dragged out four bound and gagged people. The Anbu led the prisoners to the middle of the room so that all could see them. Minato then stood up and announced the condemned's crimes. Hanzo Ichiha and Makoba Haiga from the ninja clans and Kanijiru Kura from the jewelers' guild are all guilty of the following crimes. They have aided the seditious organization known as Northeast and are accessories to a plot to murder a ninja of this village. For their crimes, all three are to be executed via immediate decapitation. Anbu, execute the sentence. The clan heads and guild representatives watched as Anbu quickly grabbed the condemned by their hair, pulled out their ninjados, and swiftly cut off the trio's heads. Many of the more sheltered guild representatives' faces started turning green at the sight of the triple execution. However, the ninja clan heads all nodded their heads in approval. They all knew that treason was one of the highest crimes that a person could commit. Minato then turned to the final traitor and the ringleader of this band of traitors. Danzo you are a worm whose depravity exceeds even Orochimaru. You dare to think yourself hokage by your actions. I, not you, decide what is best for Kanoha. Only I as the lawful successor of the first three hokages may organize a shinobi force in Kanoha. Your crimes are as follows. Organizing an illegal shinobi force known as Northeast, continuing to command Northeast when my predecessor gave you clemency by ordering Northeast disbanded instead of your head, embezzling funds from Kanoha to fund your illegal group, kidnapping my wards the orphans of Kanoha to be indoctrinated into your illegal group as your servants. Conducting illegal missions both within fire country and in neighboring countries and forging connections with illegal organizations when it suited your purpose. However, your greatest crime was to try and kill my wife and unborn child. Did you really think that could get away with this? You've been bound and gagged because your own actions have made your thoughts crystal clear to me by having your forces pose as Iwa Shinobi. This was all about Iwa's scroll of forbidden jutsus, as having it look like Iwa killed my family would cause Iwa to forfeit their scroll to us. Minato walked closer to Danzo and looked him straight in the eyes before he continued to speak. Even now, I see no remorse in your eyes over what you did. In your mind my wife and unborn child's lives are of lesser value when compared to the value of the most powerful jutsus known to Iwa and thus a fair trade. You, Danzo are more of a monster than the Biju. For all their power and the suffering they inflict, the Biju are but animals that can neither think nor reason on their own and thus must follow their instincts. However, you have consciously killed your humanity completely. I am held as a butcher of men by Iwa, but I at least am a human to my friends, family, and can weep for the loss of life caused by my hand. You cannot do that and I honestly doubt that you could even understand such a thing. Backing away from the traitor, the Hokage pulled out a scroll from his coat pocket. The numerous crimes that you have committed Danzo, both those currently known and those yet to be discovered as Anbuti Program's Northeast operatives, have made you an inhuman monster unfit for a normal execution. To simply behead you would be an insult to the three traitors who have just been executed. They, even with their grave crimes, still retain some humanity. Fairness demands that just as a human be killed in a human manner, so should a monster be killed in a monstrous manner. 
there was a large cloud of smoke as Minato activated the storage seal on the scroll he was carrying. The smoke soon cleared allowing the crowds to see a large stone box about the size of a coffin, with a pad coming out of the head of the coffin, and a frog with an open mouth standing at the foot of the coffin. All over the coffin were complex seals connected to each other, and that lead to the pad, where there were two depressions shaped like hands. Bonato's face hardened as he reaffirmed what he was about to do in his mind. This ghastly invention of his, which was honestly shocked that he could even dream let alone actually build, was to serve three purposes. First it would both make Danzo feel the pain that Minato felt at the threat to his family and would discourage future attacks on his family. Secondly, this would show both guilds and uppity clans that he was not a wet noodle who would give in to their requests just because they were from Kanoha. Despite his prowess on the battlefield, many within Kanoha thought that they could run rings around him and politics and administration of Kanoha. Finally, Danzo's horrifying execution should serve as a deterrent against treason for years to come. In a tone that was both heavy with shame for himself and absolute rage towards Danzo, Minato pronounced the ringleader's sentence. Your manner of execution will be as follows Danzo. You shall be placed in this coffin, and then the seals on it will activate forcibly extracting every last bit of water within your body. Anbu, place him in the coffin. For the first time in his life, Danzo truly felt terror. He had been prepared to be executed by this foolish upstart. However, never had Danzo imagined a student of that moron Jureya to come up with such a manner of execution. Hell, he doubted that even Orochimaru could come up with something like this. Danzo immediately began to struggle and tried to break freed, hoping that he could force the Hokage's Anbu or the Hokage himself to kill him in self-defense. The Anbu operatives had been expecting this and held on tightly to Danzo as they dragged him to the coffin. One of them punched Danzo in the stomach when they held heaved him into coffin so that the lid could be closed. The Anbu hurriedly locked the lid into place so that Minato could activate the seals by placing his hands on the hand depressions and channeling his chakra into the seal. No sound was heard from the coffin and none was needed as the frog spout started to pour out water. Ten seconds later the stream of water ended signaling that every last bit of water had been extracted. Minato quietly spoke to the Anbu standing near him. Take that coffin away from Kanoha and incinerate it. I don't want so much as a splinter left of it. Immediately after constructing the coffin, Minato had burned all plans and notes for the seals used to extract the water from Danzo. Furthermore, Minato had placed a seal on himself to destroy his memory of how to make those seals. Even in the depths of his pain and desire for revenge, Minato knew that his means of vengeance could used for ways more terrible than he could imagine if he didn't take steps to keep his revenge just on Danzo. Summoning the last of his willpower, Minato turned to the spooked out crowd. Court is now ended. Everyone go back and spend time with your families. The only way to move past dealing with such treachery is to spend time with family. Minato made his way out of the assembly room as fast as his position would admit. Once alone, Minato fell to his knees in tears as his rage and desire for vengeance, though satisfied, left him feeling only broken and empty. Here's in Siratobi, previously retired Sandame Hokage, sat back down in the chair he had left to Minato. Minato, per his last instructions before heading out to seal the Kaiubi, declared that Hiruzen would fill the position of Hokage until such time as a suitable person from the younger generations could be found to take the position damn it, the newly reinstated Hokage thought. He had already put his 30 years in for this torture, why the hell couldn't Minato find someone else to take this position? As Hiruzen was mentally gripping over the unfairness of it all, Jiraiya walked in with a newly born Naruto in his arms. The Sandame looked up and calmly asked, is this the boy? Ureya nodded his head and quickly replied, yes. This is Minato and Kashina's little boy Naruto. The kid is fine from the ceiling and the fox is securely locked away. I've triple checked the seal and can say that there is absolutely no way the fox can escape on its own and it would take a seal master of at least Minato's level to help to weaken the seal enough so that the fox could try to escape. However, I would like to mention that the seal is set up so that Naruto should be able to summon a portion of the demon's power at will when he gets older. The Sandame nodded his head and then asked, good. Please give Naruto back to his mother. I'm sure Kashina is distressed enough about losing her husband without worrying about where Naruto is. Ureya winced and solemnly said, that won't be possible sensei. Kashina had some complications with the birth and well. The Toad Sage's eyes started to water up as he fought back the emotions he was feeling so that he could explain things to Hirzen. According to the doctor I spoke to, Kashina's complications were deemed a low priority, with all of the wounded coming in from the battle, and a stasis seal was placed on her. However, whoever was supposed to place the seal didn't do a very good job causing her to bleed to death. Both men looked at Naruto and couldn't help but feel sorry for the babe. Naruto was less than a day old and yet he had lost both parents, had the most powerful demon known sealed into him, and the only thing keeping him from being on the top of Iwa's hit list was a marriage contract. 
Here is inside and asked, do you know who the Namikazes had designated to take care of Naruto if anything should happen to them? Hiraya nodded and replied, Minato and Kishina entrusted me and six others as potential guardians of Naruto if they died. Unfortunately, I'm the only one from that list that's still alive. I'd like to take care of Naruto as the boy is my godson but. The Hokage nodded his head and continued Jiraiya's thought. You're the head of our main spirings. Such a position requires too much time outside of the village to properly raise a young child and you cannot just resign your position because it would be almost impossible to replace you. Silence descended on the room as the two men each thought about what to do about Naruto. Finally, the Sandame broke the silence. With you permission Jiraiya, I could have Asuma's old nurse Kasumi care for Naruto while you're outside the village. At the very least, she could look after the boy until he is old enough that he can be left alone while you go out on your missions. Hiraya nodded and quickly agreed with Hiruzen. That would be acceptable to me. Now, there is just one thing I need to know Sensei. What are you planning to do about the ceiling with the village? We both know that there is no way that we can just pretend that the ceiling never happened. The villagers will demand an explanation. Hiruzen pulled out his pipe and took a few puffs as he thought about the situation. We let it be known that the Kaiubi was sealed away in a secure location, using a divine seal to ensure that the demon can never escape. This announcement will be worded in such a way so that the villagers make the assumption that the Kaiubi is sealed in a place or object and not in a person. Furthermore, the villagers will be informed that the location of the Kaiubi's imprisonment is a top secret will severe penalties up to the death sentence for whoever attempts to discover the seal's location. Tsuritobi closed his eyes and then continued on. Only you, I and the Tsuchikage are to know that Naruto holds the Kaiubi until Naruto is at least a genin. Hiraya quickly lost his cool when he heard the third person who would know about Naruto's condition. What? Why the hell should the Tsuchikage know that? What reason should someone in another village, let alone another country know a secret like that? The Hokage's eyes narrowed freezing the Toad Sage in mid-rant. Think Jiraiya think, this deception I'm planning won't hold forever. Eventually, people will discover that Naruto holds the Kaiubi, whether by someone figuring out what happened or Naruto displaying the Kaiubi's power. This deception is merely to buy Naruto time, so that negative perceptions of the villagers from the Kaiubi's attack have a chance to dissipate. Even if the deception holds for only a few months, people will at least have a chance to grieve and move on. My hope is that this deception will last long enough so that Naruto can begin to make a name for himself before this is revealed to the public. However, Naruto's betrothal to Asuka Tenjuin complicates matters. Inoki or possibly his successor could use Naruto's status as the jailer of the Kaiubi against us diplomatically if he is not informed immediately. Never doubt a politician's ability to twist things around if it so suits them. That's how young Naruto ended up engaged in the first place. If we inform Inoki, Hiraya started to scratch his chin as he thought over what Siratobi told him. But, the concerned godfather started to ask, what of the risk of Inoki publicly releasing this information? How can you be sure that he won't just destroy your plan to spite you? Hiruzen chuckled and then said, you do not know that Tsuchikage very well do you Jiraiya. Inoki doesn't care about things like bloodlines, clans, nor in Naruto's case having a demon sealed into a person. Power and potential are what matters to that man. Why do you think he insisted on the engagement? It was an attempt to gain a new source of power for his village at best and neutralize a source of power in another village from being used against Iwa. Inoki will not only keep our little secret, he will probably ensure that Naruto is well treated by the people of Iwa when he goes to claim his bride. Think for a moment and put yourself in Inoki's shoes. He has a solid link between Iwa and the Namikazes who gave Naruto extremely powerful clan jutsus and a solid ninja pedigree. He has an ally who should be able to call upon the power of the strongest demon ever known. If things go badly here in Konoha he can turn that ally into a subordinate. All of this Inoki gets by keeping the marriage and he gets our forbidden scroll if we break the deal. The Tsuchikage is too intelligent to discard a hand like that. A lot of information could be gathered about a person of Konoha by just observing where in the village they lived. Using the main village market square and the Hokage monument for orientation, one could find six distinct neighborhoods. Between the market square and the monument were where the village poor citizens dwelled. This wasn't a slum area due to the general cleanliness of countless D rank missions and the fact that many ninjas lived there. Even if they were only genins and washed out chunins, the ninjas ensured that no gangs developed. To the left and right of this area were apartment condominium complexes. The ones on the right typically belonged to civilians, and the ones on the left were mostly owned by non clan ninjas. There was a break in the residential areas at this point, with both sections of the circle being filled with shops and workshops that weren't able to get a spot in the main square. Past the shops on the left and right were single family homes on small plots of land. Once again, civilians tended to live in the neighborhood on the right side. 
the ninjas, typically minor clans or families that hadn't reached clan status yet, lived on the left side. Finally, directly opposite the Hokage Monument, one could find the estates of the major clans. The Sumi Takahashi owned a house in the civilian side of Kanohe near the major clan estates. The elderly woman had bought it years ago, so that she wouldn't have to travel far to reach the Saratobi estate, back when she had helped take care of the Sandame's children. The grey-haired old matron woke up at the crack of dawn to the muffled sound of jumping jacks downstairs. A slightly exasperated smile appeared on Kasumi's face as she rolled her eyes and spoke to herself. Ah Naruto, whatever am I to do with you? The elderly woman quickly got dressed and headed downstairs. She then headed to the family room where her six-year-old charge was currently doing push-ups. Kasumi put her hands on her hips and spoke in a mildly serious voice. And just what do you think you're doing young man? Naruto looked up at Kasumi with a guilty expression on his face. Training grandma. The Sumi nodded her head. That's what I thought Naruto. You know the rules, you are not to train without supervision. We don't want you to accidentally injure yourself causing you to lose weeks or months of training. Kasumi's eyes narrowed as she noticed the bands around Naruto's wrists. Naruto, are those the resistance bands that Jureya made for you? After the blonde-haired tyke nodded his head, the elderly matron held out her hand and firmly called out, Naruto Namikas, you are to take off those bands right this instant. You know that you are only supposed to use them when Jureya specifically lets you when he's training you. I let you keep them in your room because I thought you were a big boy and could be trusted not to touch them. The young Namikas hung his head in shame as he deactivated the resistance bands. These bands had special seals on them to make it feel like one was going against a strong gust of wind with every movement. Jiraiya and Minato had created the resistance bands at first as a simple exercise in applying seal theory and then incorporated them into their training. They had created stronger resistance bands that could make one feel like they struggling against a hurricane or a whirlpool of water. Naturally the bands Jiraiya gave Naruto were only beginner bands, but they were fairly strong for such a young boy. Once Kasumi had the bands in her hand she firmly said, Naruto, I'm going to lock these up until Jiraiya gets back and he decides whether or not you can have them again. I must say that I am very disappointed in you as I know you can be better than this. What is your greatest dream Naruto? The young boy blinked his eyes wondering why grandma had brought that up while she was scolding him. Nevertheless, he quickly answered the question. I want to be a greater ninja than my father, grandma. The Sumi nodded her head and then continued on. That is a good goal Naruto. Now, can you tell me what the second law of being a ninja of Kanoha is after seeing to the safety and security of Fire Country's people? Naruto scratched his head for a second as he tried to remember that part of the lessons his grandma had taught him. Bookwork always seemed so boring, unless the bookwork was on chakra or great ninjas of the past. After a few seconds Naruto hesitantly replied, to obey the orders of the Hokage and all awful superiors. After nodding her head Kasumi replied, very good Naruto. Obedience is a basic part of being a ninja, and a part of obedience is trust that a ninja will obey the instructions he is given. How can the Hokage trust you with a mission or your future squad leader trust you with an assignment if I cannot trust you to do such a simple thing as not training when you are unsupervised or to not use these resistance bands without Jureya's approval? The sad look crossed Naruto's face as he looked down at the floor in shame. In a sorrowful voice he asked, is there any way I can make things better grandma? The Sumi nodded her head. Yes there is Naruto. First, you can set the table for breakfast. Then once we have breakfast you can clean your room. If you do both these things without complaint, then I think that you'll have repaired the trust you broke. However, the resistance bands will stay locked up as a reminder to you. Naruto nodded his head and then took off like a rocket to go set the table. Kasumi shook her head with small grin on her face. Oh that boy, I don't know of any child who has as much energy and drive as he does. With his personality it is just impossible to stay mad at him. If Naruto keeps growing like he has been he'll definitely be a heartbreaker. Lenato's lucky to be dead or in 10 years the village girls would have killed him for keeping his son off the market. After breakfast was over and Naruto's room had been cleaned, Naruto and Kasumi left the house and headed towards the center of Konoha. Many people in the streets noticed the duo in the streets and gave respectful nods to them as they passed. Everyone knew that the boy's father had sacrificed his very soul to the Shinigami in order to seal the Kaiubi away in a hidden location where it would remain imprisoned for all time and that Naruto's mother had been lost in a tragic medical mistake. The fact that even with his tragic past Naruto could still be so cheerful impressed many of the villagers living near Mrs. Takahashi's home. The respectful looks from the villagers got more respectful and more formal as the duo got closer to the center of the village. These glances came from people who did not see Naruto regularly and tended to think of him as the Yandame's son and not as Naruto Namikas. A small twitch appeared on Naruto's forehead whenever one of the more exuberant well-wishers called to him as respectful air. The Sumi noted each twitch in the boy she though of as a grandson and barely held in a sigh. 
Like many children, Naruto loved to have attention lavished upon him. However, Naruto hated getting attention just because he was Minato's son. The elderly Takahashi found this trait endearing. Instead of Naruto growing a big head, he was growing a drive to succeed. Eventually, Naruto noticed where Kasumi was leading him. Grandma, why are we heading to the Hokage's tower? It wasn't that Naruto had any problems with the tower, he just thought that they were going shopping today. Kasumi smiled and quickly answered the question. The Hokage asked me to bring you to his office today. There is something he wants to talk to you about that involves something your father did before you were born. Naruto blinked his eyes for a second and then eagerly said, what is it? There was a small chuckle from Kasumi as she replied, now, now Naruto. The Hokage is taking valuable time out of his schedule to talk to you. Shouldn't you wait and let him tell you what it is he wants to talk to you about? The little blonde boy shrugged his shoulders. But grandma, grandpa Saratobi usually drops by once a week to talk to me. Why can't you just tell me what it is, and I lack surprised when grandpa tells me. While rolling her eyes, Kasumi lead Naruto into the tower. The duo then headed towards the Hokage's office. They were stopped two times by the guards to verify that both Kasumi and Naruto were supposed to be where they were in the tower. Finally, the duo was led into the Hokage's office where they saw Hiruzen sitting in his chair at the desk. The elderly Hokage stood up and quickly said, good day Kasumi, Naruto. Please, have a seat. Naruto barely waited to sit down before he began questioning Hiruzen. Hey Grandpa Saratobi, why did you have Grandma bring me here? All I was told was that this had something to do with father. Hiruzen nodded his head and smiled in his typical grandfatherly manner. That's correct Naruto. There is something that Jiraiya and I need to talk to you about. Originally, Jiraiya was supposed to explain this to you, but an important lead came up that will delay his return for a few weeks, and we wanted you to know this before you begin at the academy. Tell me Naruto, have you ever wondered how parents get together so that children can have mothers and fathers? Naruto shrugged his head and replied, yes. Grandma told me it involves something called a marriage, whatever that is. I keep on seeing older people coming out of a bar together and thing hear about them getting married a few months later. Do parents get together at bars? Both Hiruzen and Kasumi had to hide a chuckle at Naruto's child logic. Hiruzen then continued to speak now that he knew where Naruto was at. Not exactly Naruto. The way adults get together to become children's parents is like this. They meet each other somewhere like a bar, go on dates which are like hanging out with your friends only with some differences, and then if they like each other deeply enough they get married. After nodding his head, Naruto quickly spoke up, okay grandpa. But, why did you call me to your office to tell me this? Here is inside and then answered Naruto's question. I'm telling you this Naruto because when you grow up you won't be getting your wife like I just described. You see Naruto, your father had to make an arranged marriage for you. In an arranged marriage, you don't meet someone. Rather, your partner is picked out for you and you marry them. At this point Naruto interrupted the Hokage. What? Why would father do this? I'm too young. Girls of Kasumi decided that enough was enough at this point and put her hand gently but firmly on Naruto's shoulder. This calmed Naruto down enough that he could sit back down in his chair and let the Hokage speak again. Naruto, your father left you a letter explaining why he did this and he wrote it shortly after this deal was made. Hiruzen paused for a second to pull out the letter from his desk and handed it to Naruto. Read the letter Naruto and then I'll try to answer any questions you might have afterwards. Naruto nervously opened the letter and began to read what his father had written. To my child. At the time I am writing this I do not know whether you are my son or my daughter. It doesn't matter to me which you are as I love you and have loved you ever since your mother told me you were on the way. It is my fondest wish to watch you grow up, be with you as you succeed in whatever you do though I hope you chose to become a ninja and to watch as you find someone you can love like I love your mother. Sadly, events beyond my control have forced me to take part of this wish away. As you are reading this letter, you know about the deal I had to make with Itsuchikij putting you into an arranged marriage. I did not wish to make this agreement and I am truly sorry that you have been forced to have a spouse not of your choosing. Unfortunately, the Tsuchikij presented the proposal in such a way that if I rejected it, Kanoha's reputation would be harmed which would directly harm the village itself, since reputation is vital for a ninja village's survival. My attempts to make the Tsuchikij retract his proposal by adding contingencies in place only ensured that you and your future spouse are well treated by the village you will be living in. As Hokage, I must do everything in my power and ensure the safety of the village and all who live in it. Your marriage ensures the end of this war and helps prevent the possibility of a future war occurring between earth and fire, thus saving potentially hundreds or thousands of lives. It is a bitter thing for a father to trade his child's happiness to ensure that others live. I am deeply sorry for this and hope that one day you can forgive me. If it helps, think of this arrangement as a lifelong mission. Your mission is to ensure the safety of Kanoha by having a long and happy, or at least tolerable, marriage. 
Hopefully, you and your spouse can grow to love each other or at least become good friends. Sorry it came to this my child. Your father. Bonato Namikaz, Yandame Hokage. Naruto read and reread the letter in order to observe the full message that his father was trying to convey. The young ninja to be didn't understand all of the words in the letter since he was only six. However, he did understand the message his father was trying to get across. After looking at the letter yet another time, Naruto looked up at Hiruzen. My father really didn't want to do this, did he? The Hokage nodded his head and would have spoken if Naruto didn't cut him off. I don't want to do this either. But, I know it's something that must be done. A lot of people are counting on this happening aren't they grandpa? Hiruzen nodded his head again proud at the maturity that Naruto was showing. That's right Naruto, your marriage is important and there is a lot riding on it being a success. Jiraiya and I wanted to let you know now so that you could get used to the idea instead of having it thrust upon you when you were older. Furthermore, Jiraiya and I have recently made arrangements with your future wife's family so things aren't so bad when it comes time for the wedding between you and Asuka. Asumi spoke up since Naruto's brain seemed to be on the verge of shutting down. What are these arrangements? The Hokage quickly replied, we have set up a secure postal route, not an easy task mind you, so that Naruto and Asuka can send letters to each other. Neither of them is allowed to leave their village until they are either genins or adults for security reasons. Having them able to write to each other will allow both Naruto and Asuka to get to know each other before the wedding. At least this way they can get to know each other before they meet face to face. Later that night, Naruto was sitting at the desk in his room trying to think of a letter to write. Kasumi had insisted that he write a letter to Asuka introducing himself. Unbidden, her words from dinner came back to Naruto. You really should take this opportunity to get to know your future bride. Most people in arraigned marriages don't find out who they're marrying until the wedding day. Besides the Hokage set up a way for you to send letters to Asuka and it is very hard to send letters from Kanoha to Earth Country. But, what was he supposed to write? Naruto honestly didn't fully get exactly what was going on. Sure, he knew what marriage was, at least he knew as well as any six-year-old could. However, Naruto wasn't quite sure what he was supposed to say in the letter. An idea came to Naruto and he started to write his letter. After writing a few words, Naruto decided to pitch his would-be letter and start again. This process continued for a while as the young groom-to-be worked on his letter. Asumi came into Naruto's room two hours after Naruto started working on his letter in order to tuck him into bed. The old matron quickly brought her hand to her mouth to keep herself from giggling at what she saw. Naruto was fast asleep in the chair with his head on the desk. As Kasumi walked towards the desk, she noticed a letter next to Naruto's head. Curious, Kasumi picked it up and inspected the letter. It turned out to be complete except for Naruto's signature. She quickly read over the letter to see what Naruto had written. Hi. My name's Naruto. I'm told that we'll get married one day in the future. Marrying a stranger doesn't sound fun, so let's get to know each other. I like my uncle Jiraiya, my grandma Kasumi, and my grandpa Saratobi. Well, Jiraiya is my godfather, but I see him as an uncle. Kasumi and Saratobi aren't my grandparents, but I see them as such. I also like Raymond and training. I'm going to be the best ninja ever, just you see. Kanoha is a great place to live. Do you like Iowa? Well, I hope you like the letter. I can't wait for your letter. The letter was short and sweet for a six-year-old. Kasumi quickly pulled out another sheet of paper and copied Naruto's letter word for word. She thought that Naruto's first letter to his bride was something precious and should be recorded. If she held a copy, then there was no chance of it getting lost over the years. Besides, it would be great to whip it out and embarrass Naruto and Asuka with when they were teens, especially if she kept a copy of Asuka's reply as well. Once the copy was safely tucked away, Kasumi gently picked Naruto up and placed him on his bed. Kasumi then pulled the covers up to Naruto's chin and then gently kissed his forehead. Good night Naruto and sleep tight. Yugaku Uchiha stood in the Uchiha clan's meeting hall and calmly watched as his fellow clan members walked into the room. For far too long, the Uchiha clan had been neglected by the village. They were the only founding clan still in the village after that washed-up woman Tsunade left. The mantle of Hokage was the Uchiha's right. Fugaku had been willing to tolerate Minato as the Yandame. The man had been powerful and at the time a strong, unquestionable leader was necessary to win the war. However, Minato Namikaze had passed away seven years ago. For seven years, Hiruzen had held the position of Hokage, and each passing day was like a slap in the face to Fugaku. With the Yandame's passing, a Godame should have been elected, more precisely, an Ichiha Godame should have been elected. The Ichiha clan head didn't care if it was himself or a cousin that held the position. He just wanted his clan to finally have the rule of the village they had created. As the hall filled up, Fugaku thought about what he was planning. The overthrow of the Sandame. He could deal with Hiruzen retaking the position of Hokage. It was a bitter and almost unbearable blow, but it was something that could be corrected with time. 
the old monkey would eventually have to give up the position due to death or old age, and then Agadim would have to be chosen. Yugaku had been quietly preparing for that day so that Itachi, whom he was vigorously training in order to build up the needed reputation, could become Hokage. But, a Hokage needed more than personal power. A Hokage needed support from the village and more importantly the daimyo in order to stay in power. The Ichiha clan was steadily losing support from the village thanks to the older generation, remembering that Fugaku's granduncle Madara had been able to control the Kaiubi with his Sharingan. There were whispers that someone had been seen near the Kaiubi while it attacked the village. These dark alley rumors which were slowly growing more and more frequent claimed that this mysterious figure was in Ichiha who had summoned the Kaiubi to attack the village. Fugaku knew that these rumors were slowly destroying the clan's reputation. If things kept up, the clan's reputation would be so low that even if Itachi was the best ninja in the village, the daimyo would select someone else to be the Hokage. His father had worked tirelessly to ensure that the clan didn't become some non-entity politically like the Hyuga clan. There was no way that Fugaku was going to let that happen on his watch. Taking what was rightfully the clan's by force was the only viable option Fugaku could see. It was a risky move, but the clan had enough ninjas to pull off a coup, and it was possible to bribe the daimyo with lower mission rates to get his approval once everything had settled. Once the last Ichiha came into the room, Fugaku started to speak. This village was founded by our clan and the Senju clan. But, ever since that day our clan has had to endure a subordinate position in the village. The Senjus are long gone, but we the sole surviving founding clan are still kept in a subordinate position. We are not recognized for what we truly are. It is our strength that supports this village. Without our sight, Kanoha would be blind. For years we have kept the peace within these walls, collected jutsus from our enemies, giving the village vital knowledge to survive in war, and we have done this without once receiving proper thanks for our efforts. As individuals and as a clan we could endure this lack of thanks. After all, we were patiently waiting in the shadows for our time to come. A time when this village that we founded and put so much effort into keeping alive would ask us to come out of the shadows and receive the recognition that we so truly deserved. But, there are elements within the village that seek to deny us what is our right. If they had their way, the Ichiha clan would be ground to dust and people would forget everything we have sacrificed for the good of Kanoha. That cannot be allowed to happen. We will not dishonor the efforts of our ancestors and dearly departed brethren by allowing these seditious people to have their way. For the good of all within Kanoha, the Ichiha clan shall step out of the shadows and take control of the village. Yugaku's speech was abruptly interrupted when several small explosions that sounded like fireworks going off were heard. Thick clouds of blue gas filled the meeting hall. Yugaku, like most of the assembled Ichihas, tried to cover his mouth and nose. However, there was too much gas in the room, and the Ichihas all dropped to the floor before any of them could open a door or window. The first thing Itachi saw when he woke up was a blinding light that forced him to close his eyes. Careful there, the knockout gas heightens your sensitivity to light. Just keep your eyes closed and breathe deeply. The counteragent will take care of that problem shortly. Itachi did as he was told and he started to feel better. After a few seconds that same voice spoke again. Okay good, I now want you to slowly open your eyes. Itachi slowly opened his eyes as directed and was greeted by the sight of a smiling nurse. The nurse then removed the breather mask on Itachi's face. There we go, welcome back to the land of the awake. That was a lot of knockout and paralysis gas you inhaled sir. There won't be any long term effects, but you will feel tired for the next 12 hours. The doctor says that you should take it easy for the next 24 hours. The young Anbu operative nodded his head. I understand. Don't worry, I will follow those instructions to the letter. To Itachi's surprise, the nurse gave him a firm and serious glare. Make sure you do sir. We here at the hospital know how to deal with ninjas who think that they can ignore doctor's orders. A small chuckle came from the door causing Itachi and the nurse to look in that direction. They both saw Hiruzen standing in the doorway with a small grin on his face. Hello Itachi, Ms. Naoki. The nurse quickly bowed her head and Itachi gave the Hokage a sight nod as well. Hiruzen walked towards the bed and then spoke. Ms. Naoki, would it be too inconvenient for you if you were to leave Itachi and I alone for a few minutes? I need to be debriefed about what happened at the meeting hall and it is a matter of vital village security. Ms. Naoki quickly bowed her head again. Certainly sir, would 15 minutes be enough time? Hiruzen nodded his head. That will be enough. Now, go. Once the nurse left the room, Hiruzen focused his attention on Itachi. I take it that we ran out of time to convince your father to talk. Itachi nodded his head regrettably sir. My father ordered everyone to show up in battle gear. Battle plans would likely have been given after his speech if I hadn't triggered those smoke bombs. Furthermore, my father had amassed more support within the clan for his plan than either you or I suspected. No one at the meeting showed any dissenter hesitancy when my father announced the coup attempt. 
The Hokage's old eyes seemed to age 20 years when he heard that, and then he sighed. I'm sorry it came to this Itachi. I honestly tried to get your father and your clan to see how valuable to the village. The bedridden ninja raised his hand. No need to apologize to me sir. It was father's fault for keeping the clan isolated from the rest of the village. Those rumors that bothered him and the rest of the clan so much wouldn't have occurred if the clan was in regular contact with the village at large. Pirazin nodded his head. You are quite correct Itachi. It pains me what you've had to endure for this village. This night will leave scars on all of us for a long time. Sadly, what must be done has to be done, and traitors cannot be allowed to live. Your father and the men in the meeting hall will be put to death. The women will be examined by the doctors. If they are pregnant their execution will be stayed until their children are born. Otherwise, they'll be executed tonight as well. You are now the head of the Achiha clan Itachi. I'm sorry you had to receive this position in such a manner. Unable to speak, Itachi nodded his head and then just lay on the bed. Hiruzen wished Itachi good night and then left the room. Itachi felt like there was a ton of bricks pressing down on him as the thought of everything that had happened came crashing down on him. He, at 15, was now the head of disgraced clan and he had a direct part in killing four fives of the clan. Even though his kinsmen had been traitors, Itachi was torn up about his role in stopping the proposed coup. It was only the thought of his little brother and the young children within the clan that he was now responsible that kept Itachi from trying to find a way to commit suicide. After an hour of mourning, Itachi forced himself to think about what he should do to look after what was left of the clan. A clear break needed to be made between the survivors and the traitors in the villagers' mind when news of what happened got out. Perhaps he should publicly break down the walls his father had erected around the Ichiha section. Yes, that would be a good start. But, something more dramatic seemed to be needed. What, Itachi wasn't sure yet. Another thing that jumped out at Itachi was the need for the survivors to integrate better into the village as a whole. Those in the academy would have to be encouraged to work with their classmates, and those too young to go to the academy should probably be taken to public parks to play instead of playing at the clan park. He should also set an example himself to the rest of his clansmen. Maybe he should take a bride from one of the minor merchant families. Members of those families would likely accept such an offer, even from a dishonored clan, due to the financial resources at his call. Such a move would drive home that he was not his father. However, Itachi decided to table his thoughts and get some sleep. There would be time enough in the morning to make these decisions. No reason to make a decision now. Itachi silently walked into the room in the Hokage's tower where the remains of his clan had been gathered. All in all there were 17 children in the room when Itachi walked in. The oldest children were 12-year-old twins who were beginning their final year in the academy. The youngest child was a 4-year-old girl, there were none younger than her because the adults in the clan didn't want to have to worry about defending infants during their playing coup. Suddenly, Sasuke pushed his way through the small crowd and ran to Itachi. Brother. Brother. What's going on? Where are father and mother? Some ninjas in masks pick us up and brought us here. The pang of guilt stabbed Itachi in the heart, but he showed no outward sign of it. The new clan head looked at his surviving kinsmen and said, there is no easy way to tell you all this. As of this moment, we are all that remains of the Ichiha clan. Naturally, shell-shocked looks crossed all the children's faces. Sasuke's eyes widened and he whispered out, mother, father, dead. How? That just can't be. Knowing that this needed to be explained firmly started speaking again. There had been a plot in the works by our kinsmen to take over the village. Sasuke, mother and father were in charge of the plot and were captured by Anbu. Can anyone tell me what the punishment for treason is? One of the twins gave the answer in a sad whisper. Death, the punishment for treason is death. Itachi nodded his head, it pains me to say it, but all of our parents and your older siblings were traitors to the village. As such, they are being executed as I speak. The only reason we are here is because the Hokage spared our lives since we had no part in the plot. After pausing for a moment to look at each child Itachi continued, news of what has happened tonight will spread quickly throughout the village. We will be pariahs to most villagers. They will not see us as representing the police who kept them safe all those years, they will only see the sons and daughters of traitors who tried to overthrow the Hokage. A few of your friends, those who can think for themselves, will likely remain your friends. However, many of those who you used to hang out with will look down on you. I don't want to scare you or be mean to you by saying this. I am trying to prepare you all for what is to come. This day will reflect on us for a long time. However, we can and will restore the honor of our clan. It will be a long and difficult time, but through hard work we can remove the stain that our parents left us with. I want you all to think about and strive towards the day when the events of this day no longer haunt us. Many of the younger children couldn't understand some of the words Itachi used. Still, everyone in the room understood the meaning of what Itachi was telling them. The emotion in the room quickly lead the 18 Achihas into a group hug as everyone cried. 
Naruto was sitting in one of the trees in the academy playground, reading the latest letter Asuka sent him. The letter itself was hidden in the pages of Naruto's favorite book, The Legend of the Gutsy Ninja. Although Naruto was currently the strongest boy in his class, he knew that he'd lose all of the guys' respect if they knew he was getting a letter from a girl. The blonde-haired ninja to be had turned reading Asuka's letters into a sort of game. He won if he could read the letter without getting caught. So far the score was Naruto 5, shame 0. Even with the threat of ridicule, Naruto couldn't help reading Asuka's letter. Hello Naruto. I hope that this letter gets to you in time for your 8th birthday. Mother says that this should get to Konoha within a week of your birthday, so it's either happy early birthday or happy late birthday greetings from me. Thanks for the photo of you that you sent in your last letter. It's great to actually see you. Mother helped me find a frame for it and I have it set up by my bed. My training is going well. Father has finally started teaching me the basics of my family's golem jutsus. I can't tell you anything more than that since they're family jutsus and you're not family yet. I'm once again in the blue squad at the Iwa Shinobi Institute. It's nice to be recognized as one of the best students currently in school, but I wish the professor in charge of our squad was different. That annoying man keeps on talking about blue squad as if it should be the only squad at the institute. He's tolerant enough of yellow squad but absolutely hates red squad for some reason. Enough of the institute how are things with you? Did you get your resistance bands back after your grandmother took them from you again? Also, some rumors have reached Iowa about some problems your village had with one of the clans. If it's not too much trouble, can you tell me what happened? I don't need to know the specifics, I just want to know what exactly happened and not some wild school rumors. Until next time. Asuka Tenjun. Finished reading the letter, Naruto closed his book and remembered his picture of Asuka hanging on the wall next to his bed. His nine-year-old pen pals, it was easier to think of her as that than as his fiancée, image instantly came to mind. Asuka had long brownish yellow hair that she let grow long and sharp brown eyes. Her face had a determined and yet friendly expression that Naruto found captivating. Naruto's quiet reflections on his future bride were abruptly interrupted by the sound of a nearby commotion. The Namika's heir turned his head and brought his hand up to his ear. He then heard the sounds of some children taunting someone. Trader spawn. Look it's Trader boy. You going to turn on us Trader boy? A tick formed on Naruto's head as he listened to what was being said. The eight-year-old quickly put his book back in his backpack and started to walk down the tree. Naruto marched across the playground where he saw several older students crowding around one of his classmates and continuing their cruel taunts. He spotted two pebbles lying on the ground next to his feet. In one swift motion Naruto picked up the pebbles and threw them at two of the bullies. Both pebbles hit their targets in the back of the head, causing the boys to scream in pain. Instantly, the older academy boys turned to see Naruto staring back at them. The leader of the bullies shouted out, what the hell was that for? That, Naruto replied as seriously as an eight-year-old could, was for teasing my classmate. You should be ashamed of yourselves for picking on someone. The leader of the group snorted and shot back get real. Why should we be ashamed of treating this trash like he deserves? He's an Achiha and everyone knows that they're nothing but a bunch of thieving scum. The beastly growl escaped from Naruto's mouth that put the bullies on edge. A man cannot be judged by his parents. The only scum I see are five pompous idiots who are too full of themselves and yet are such cowards that they'll pick on someone four years younger than themselves. Get. Out. Now. Naruto started to unconsciously flare his chakra. He wasn't sending out a killing intent, but Naruto was projecting his anger at the older students. This made himself seem much more frightening to them than he otherwise would be. The five bullies started to slowly back away from Naruto and their previous target. They then started running towards the older class's cafeteria like something was chasing them. Naruto gave the retreating bullies one last glare as he muttered, jerks. With the losers out of the way, Naruto turned to see Sasuke Chiha lying on the ground, like he had been shoved there with tears, threatening to come pouring out of his eyes. Naruto walked over to Sasuke and offered his hand. Hey there, would you like a hand up? Sasuke jerked his head towards Naruto and looked at the offered hand. The young Ichiha's eyes then hardened as he thought of the pity Naruto was showing him. I don't need your help. In fact, I didn't need your help in the first place. Naruto blinked his eyes in confusion. What? But you were. Sasu quickly interrupted Naruto and screamed out. I didn't need your help. The young Ichiha forced himself up from the ground and started walking away. As he walked away Sasu muttered to himself, like someone like you could help me. Alright Jiraiya, I'm coming at you with everything I've got. Forget it Naruto, you're too young to beat the gallant Jiraiya. The Toad Sage grinned as he watched his godson charge at him wielding the staff Hiruzen had given the boy for his 11th birthday. Jiraiya waited for Naruto to get in close and then he let loose a powerful haymaker. Naruto quickly blocked the punch with one end of his staff and then swept at Jiraiya's legs with the other end. 
The Toad Sage jumped to avoid the leg attack and flipped in midair to avoid a blow to the family jewels. Once Jureya had his feet on the ground he did three backflips to get some distance between him and his godson. The Sanin reached into his vest, pulled out three kunai, and threw them at Naruto. His godson grinned and deflected the kunai with practiced ease. Jureya knew that Naruto would deflect the kunai and use this time to go underground. Naruto quickly realized his godfather's plan and used his staff to assist in leaping to a tree that was some distance away. The young academy student calmly landed on a tree branch and grinned knowing that Jureya's plan had failed. Naruto moved to turn and see where Jureya would pop up at. However, the blonde found he could not move his legs and looked down to see that the entire tree branch was covered in glue. Congratulations Naruto, you just died. Naruto whipped his head towards his godfather's voice and saw Jureya standing in a nearby tree branch with his hands forming the tiger seal. Jureya immediately cancelled the jutsu he had been preparing and sat down on the tree branch. Come on kid, how many times do I have to tell you to never ever lose track of your opponent? Secondly, why did you jump towards such an obvious trap? Seriously Naruto, this is the only tree within 600 meters of this field. Its position as the highest ground on the battlefield makes it a prime trap spot for anyone who gets here first and is fighting a defensive battle. You should have used your pole to jump straight up into the air and prepared a long-range jutsu to attack me while you were in the air. This would have let you turn the situation against the average ninja. Naruto nodded his head as he listened to Jureya's critiquing. The young Namakas carefully listened and made sure to memorize what Jureya was telling him. His godfather might be the biggest pervert on the continent, but he was also one of the best ninjas a person could find. Soon enough Jureya finished explaining everything that Naruto had done right and wrong. With everything explained, Naruto unfastened his shoes and leaped down to the ground. His shoes would be free after the glue evaporated in an hour. Jureya and Naruto quickly got into a tojutsu sparring match. The Toad Sage limited himself to using just a little more skill and strength than Naruto had. Naruto knew that Jureya was restricting himself but didn't bother to complain. This match was to help Naruto improve his skills, not give Jureya a punching bag. Back and forth the two fraught as time passed by. Naruto rarely if ever got a blow in, but he was slowly winning from simply outlasting Jureya. Finally, after the second hour of the fight Jureya called out, that's enough Naruto. I'm calling this fight a draw. The sweating Sanin sat down in the grass and pulled out bottle of water. He quickly gulped down the water and wiped the sweat away from his face. Good fight Naruto, if you can just last long enough you'll be able to beat anyone. Naruto nodded as he caught his breath. The young ninja to be had more stamina than anyone his age had a right to have, but even Naruto couldn't keep fighting for two hours straight without feeling some effects. Both Naruto and Jureya quietly sat in the field relaxing after a hard day of training. It was the last week before finals at the academy and Jureya had wanted to make sure his godson was ready before he left to go maintain his spirings. The comfortable silence between the two ended when Naruto spoke up. Jureya, there's something I want to ask you. I've always had way more chakra than anyone else my age. I also heal far faster than anyone should by themselves. After all, I've had to do chakra control exercises years before other kids in order to keep control of my enormous chakra stores and I've had cuts heal overnight that would have taken a week to heal for anyone else. Why is that? Jureya closed his eyes and thought about what he should say. It wasn't like he could just brush Naruto off and tell him to forget about it all. That would simply cause the boy to keep on digging and possibly alert others. But on the other hand, Jureya didn't want to hurt Naruto by telling him about the Kaiubi. That could cause him to grow bitter and angry. However, simply leaving everything alone risked letting an enemy be the one to reveal the truth to Naruto, and that was unacceptable. Finally, Jureya made up his mind and quickly checked to make sure that they were alone. Alright Naruto, I'll explain. However, I must impress upon you the importance of keeping what I'm about to tell you secret. If we were not talking about you then you wouldn't be allowed to know. So, once I tell you why you heal so fast and have such abnormally large chakra stores you can't tell anyone. It all goes back to your father and his battle with the Kaiubi. As you know, he used the Shiki Fuigen to summon the Shinigami and sealed the Kaiubi away. Originally, this jutsu was designed to immediately send both the caster and the target straight into the Shinigami's stomach. However, there is a catch. The victim is supposed to have their soul filtered by the caster's soul and then both are devoured by the Shinigami. The Kaiubi's power was simply too great for your father to handle and the demon would have simply overloaded the jutsu had Minato not made his revisions. This is where your abilities come in Naruto. Minato's revision was to seal the Kaiubi within you because a newborn can adapt to handle demonic chakra and your father wouldn't ask anyone to make a sacrifice he wouldn't make himself. By placing the Kaiubi within you, your father set it up so that the Kaiubi would slowly be prepared to be consumed by the Shinigami over your lifetime. The unique abilities you've displayed are a byproduct of holding the demon. 
Naruto blinked his eyes and then nervously asked, then the whole Kaiubi being sealed in a safe place for all eternity. Was that all a lie? Gureya shook his head, a slight misdirection of the truth. The Kaiubi is sealed for all eternity by the Shinigami, as the divinely powered seal makes it impossible for the Kaiubi to escape. Also, what is a safer place to store something? A hidden location that a human can reach or with someone who can defend the item, and almost no one knows has the item. After carefully thinking about it Naruto answered his godfather. The second option is the safer way to store something. The toad sage nodded his head. You're correct Naruto. Now, I want you to remember not to reveal this information to anyone. After Naruto nodded his head Jiraiya changed topics, well Naruto let's go eat. Naruto walked into his old classroom proudly wearing his new headband and sat down in his old seat one last time. The new genin was also happy to show off his new ninja uniform. This outfit consisted of dark orange pants and a jacket which had black tiger stripes over them, along with a black t-shirt underneath the jacket. His staff was stored in a seal on his jacket. Soon after Naruto sat down his friend Kiba took the seat next to him. The Namakas and Inuzuka heirs were fairly decent friends and friendly rivals. Kiba looked around the classroom as more former students came in and grinned he then ribbed Naruto with his elbow. Hey buddy Hinata's checking you out. Why don't you go and say hello before team placement starts? Other than rolling his eyes, Naruto didn't outwardly respond to Kiba's badgering. Dating didn't really have much of a point when one was already betrothed to someone else. Naruto was friendly enough with the girls of his class, but he never did anything that could be construed as more than simple friendship. This never stopped any schoolgirl crushes. However, this policy did prevent the girls from becoming crazy fangirls. Naruto just prayed that things didn't go too crazy when the girls crushing on him found out about Asuka. Aruka walked into the classroom and started to speak, good day my former students. Let me first say something that I have wanted to say ever since the beginning of the year. I hope to never see anyone you in here again, especially you Kiba with your pranks. After a round of giggles from the class Aruka continued on. All joking aside, I must say that it has been a pleasure and an honor to teach all of you. Today I will be turning your education over to Jonans who will help you further in becoming the next generation of ninjas in Konoha. But, before I do that there is the Mater of the Rookie of the Year award. Normally, this reward is given to the student who consistently displayed the best understanding and skill in the shinobi arts while attending the academy. This year is different because we had two individuals whose rankings were too close for the teacher's panel to decide. Therefore, both Naruto Namikas and Sasuke Chia have been declared by the teacher's panel as this year's Rookies of the Years. Both boys quickly turned to look at each other while the whole class clapped their hands. Naruto's cheerful and open expression was the direct opposite of the expression on Sasuke's face. The student sitting between the two started to feel a little nervous from the silent energy being exchanged by the boys. This tenseness ended when Sasuke quietly grunted and Naruto ever so slightly nodded his head. Iruka continued on listing the teams while this was happening. Our next instructor is Hiashi Hayuga, who will be teaching Ino Yamanaka, Naruto Namikas, and Shino Aburam. Inachi Yamanaka will be teaching Kiba Inuzuka, Sasuke Chiha, and Shikamarinara. Itachi Ichiha will be teaching Choji Akamichi, Hinata Hayuga, and Sakura Haruno. Bakashi Haddock will be teaching at this point Naruto only bothered to pay half attention to the list of students and teachers. Soon enough, Iruka finished the list of teams and explained what the teams were supposed to do. Now, I want all of you genins to listen up and listen very carefully. Outside the classroom on the bulletin board are clearly written directions to where your instructors will be at in one hour. You must be at the specified location at the specified time. If you are not, then your instructor will deem you as unable to perform the basic functions of a ninja and have you striped of both your ninja license and your chance to reapply to the academy. Once you have met up with your instructor you will be given a team test to see if you are truly ready to be a ninja. The academy test was simply to see if you had the basic skills down. If you pass your instructor's test you will start your genin training and ninja career. If you fail your instructor's test you will be placed in a one-year remittal course here at the academy. Remember, you're supposed to be adults now. Your actions will have consequences for you and your future. Everyone dismissed. The Ashi Hayuga calmly sat on the grass by one of the small streams that ran through Kanoha, serenely sipping freshly made tea from a small tea kettle he had set up nearby on a rock. As he sat, the Hayuga clan leader reflected on his current situation. This would be his fourth time as an instructor for a genin squad if his would-be pupils passed his test. It was Hiashi's hope that his new potential students would be at least as good as his previous students. Ino, Shino, and Naruto arrived 10 minutes before the time Aruka said they had to be there by. Hiashi held his teacup near his lips and closed his eyes. You're too early. Your instructions were to be here one hour after your academy instructor announced the teams, you were not instructed to arrive here 50 minutes after the announcement. A ninja must be on time and neither early or late. 
to do either of these will have devastating consequences in combat. Give me a good reason why I shouldn't fail you now for being irresponsible. Shino's eyebrows appeared above his sunglasses, and Ino's eyes bulged out in surprise. However, Naruto quickly bowed his head and answered Hiashi. We were only informed that there would be penalties if we were late. I suggested to my teammates that we arrive early to ensure that we met the deadline. Hiashi opened his eyes and stared directly at Naruto. Those white eyes seemed to drill into Naruto's blue eyes as Hiashi searched for something. After a few seconds Hiashi stopped staring and took a sip of his tea. He then set the cup down and announced his decision. That is sound reasoning for a fresh academy student and I respect your owning up to your actions. Very well then, you three have passed the first test. If you pass the second test you will be on time for all team meetings. The Hyuga clan head pulled out a small scroll and used it to seal up his tea set. He then stood up and looked at the trio in front of him. Other instructors usually begin this part of the exam with a round of introductions. You should already know each other well enough to work together in this test from your time at the academy. You also know my name and that is enough while you take your final test. If you pass, I will let you know more about me. Your test is simple. I will place a scroll down on the ground, you will pick it up, and then you will do your best to give the scroll to my former student Kurinai. You will be shown a photo of Kurinai and a map of where she will be waiting before the test begins. I will be preventing you from giving the scroll to Kurinai. If she does not receive the scroll within an hour of the test starting you will fail. I will give you 5 minutes to plan your strategy before the test begins. The Ashi showed the trio a photo of Kurinai, then showed them a map of where she would be, and finally walked away, so that the planning could begin. Naruto immediately pulled his teammates together. Okay Shino and Ino, we know what we've got to do so do you have any ideas? Ino quickly voiced her opinion. You should carry the scroll Naruto. You did get the best track record out of the three of us at the academy. Shino adjusted his sunglasses. I disagree. Hayuga would know that Naruto would be the likely carrier for just that reason. Logically Hayuga will target Naruto, run him down due to better physical conditioning, and take the scroll. Someone else should carry the scroll. At this point Naruto added his two cents. Hey, all that matters is that the scroll gets to Kurinai. Since only one person can carry a scroll we should have the other two people delay Hiashi. I'll be one of the delayers, and I think Shino should be the other since he's a better fighter than you Ino. Ino looked like she wanted to punch Naruto, but Shino quickly interfered. I agree with Naruto. Ino's abilities are not primarily directed towards direct confrontation and should be the runner. However, she should not be the one to pick up the scroll. Naruto should retrieve the scroll and pass it to Ino. Naruto nodded his head, and then both boys turned to look at Ino. Fine, I'll be the runner. You two had better make sure that our instructor doesn't get close to me, because if we have to go to remedial training, I will personally turn it into hell for both of you. A minute later Hiashi stepped back into the trio's line of sight and called out to them. Your five minutes are up. The test begins now. With that, Hiashi threw the scroll at the trio and it landed by their feet. Naruto quickly snatched up the scroll, and the trio bolted as Hiashi ran towards them with his bloodline active. Shino turned around to delay Hiashi by releasing most of his kakechu. The small cloud of insects quickly spread out and moved to surround Hiashi. At the same time, Shino jumped into the tree branches to get away from his opponent. The Byakugan would likely find him, but Shino figured that this should delay Hiashi. The Hyuga clan head would have to take him out to stop the small swarm, losing valuable time to catch his teammates. To Shino's surprise Hiashi made a fist with his right hand for a few seconds. He then threw a punch while shouting, Haki Hasan Jeki. There was a momentary white flash of light, and then the Kakechu in the center of the cloud were sent flying. Most of the destruction bugs smashed into the surrounding trees and died on impact. Both of Shino's eyebrows rose above his shades after seeing half of his allies die from a single attack. However, the young Aburam wasn't about to let his allies die in vain and began throwing his shurikens at Hiashi while jumping from tree to tree. Hiashi quickly jumped out of the way and into the trees. The would-be Jonin instructor rapidly closed in on Shino to get within striking range. Shino barely managed to stay one step ahead of his opponent as he kept jumping backwards away from the attacks. The whole tempo of the fight suddenly changed when Hiashi landed on a tree branch and was struck by a jolt of electricity. He quickly jumped back to the last branch he had been on and started looking. It didn't take the Byakugan wielder much time at all to spot four seal tags. Seals weren't Hiashi's specialty, but he knew that Naruto had received some training in both seal creation and usage from Jiraiya. Naruto unexpectedly jumped out of the ground behind Hiashi and used Fuiten. To top it before the Jonin could properly react. Hiashi was sent flying towards the barrier and hit it. The young Namekis quickly landed on the ground and rushed towards the barrier. Unlike Hiashi, Naruto passed through the barrier unharmed thanks to a tag he was carrying. 
The two genin quickly met up on the other side of the barrier and watched as Hiyashi struggled to escape. Naruto turned to look at his partner. That barrier won't hold him for long him for long Shino. How are you holding up? Shino quickly replied, I've lost many of my kakechu, my shuriken supply is down to 15% and I am rather fatigued from physical exertion. Even with trying to catch his breath the young bug user was able to sound calm and logical. Naruto nodded his head and pulled a scroll out of his jacket and tossed it to Shino. There's a hundred shuriken sealed inside. Stay back and distract Hiyashi with those while I take him on with my staff. Shino nodded his head and moved into position while Naruto summoned his staff. They were just in time as the barrier seals gave way and Hiyashi landed on the ground steaming mad. Even someone as level-headed as the Hyuga clan head would be enraged after being electrocuted. Naruto was soon at his wit's end as he frantically dogged and deflected Hiyashi's attack. If it wasn't for Shino and his lone shurikens Naruto was sure he would have been beaten in the first few seconds. All too soon, Shino ran out of shuriken. Naruto's comparatively meager defenses soon failed against Hiyashi's assault, leaving the blonde ninja with his tenketsu closed. Shino quickly leaped down from the tree branch and moved to pick up Naruto. However, the young Aburam quickly pined to a nearby tree by Kunai. Both boys were clearly beaten with no hope of being able to delay Hiyashi any longer. The Jonin gave a slight nod at the boy's efforts and moved to simply knock them out before he went after Ino. Hiyashi's hand was centimeters away from Naruto's neck when a red flare went up in the distance staying Hiyashi's hand. The Hyuga clan leader looked at the flare for a second and then a small smile appeared on his face. Well done you two. You managed to delay me long enough for your partner to deliver the scroll to Kurinai. If this had been in the field both of you would be dead or captured by the enemy, but the vital information you would be protecting would be safe. Therefore you have completed your mission and passed this test. To Naruto's surprise, Hiyashi reached down and helped him up. You both showed acceptable potential today. I will help you reach that potential so that you can complete missions like this and many more without having to sacrifice yourselves. Hiyashi walked home after confirming his new team with the register's office in the Hokage Tower. He quickly made it to the front of the Hyuga clan complex, where he was greeted by the two guards who promptly bowed to their clan head. This greeting was quickly responded to by a slight nod of the head from Hiyashi. The clan head then briskly walked into the center of the complex where the main family lived. He then headed to his office and proceeded to tackle his responsibilities as clan head. Being the head of a major clan was not as time-consuming as people might think. Individuals and families within a major clan, even one as centralized as the Hyuga, had a great deal of autonomy. There were only five situations from the clan members that merited Hiyashi's attention as clan head. First was if someone was going to get married. In that situation, his job was to check to make sure that any dowries or bride prices put up were fair and then give the couple his blessing. Next, the clan head was involved if anyone was planning on buying or selling land. This was because land technically belonged to the clan as a whole, with the individual being the permanent administrator of the land. After that came the duty of making sure that the clan had at least the minimum number of shinobi available to meet its quota for the village. Not providing the minimum shinobi would violate the Hyuga's oath to the Hokage and could cause harsh penalties for the clan if the Hokage wanted to press the issue. Yet another task was representing the clan on certain village religious festivals. Finally, Hiyashi had the responsibility to settle internal clan disputes. Issues would only be brought to the courts if the matter involved someone outside the clan. These duties took very little time to complete. Fifteen minutes once a week because two clan members were arguing over something trivial, like whether or not someone's goat had eaten another's flowers was the typical situation that Hiyashi found himself in. He also didn't have that much day-to-day -day business with the clan finances either. Tithes were paid into the clan fund from missions automatically, and he decided which merchant league or craft association those funds should be invested in. Even then, Hiyashi pretty much just rubber-stamped the decisions after reading an analysis made by one of the clan financial advisors. Hiyashi had just finished looking over the paperwork showing what the clan had made from the Butcher's Guild when Hinata came into his office. Putting the report down, the clan head turned to face his daughter. He mentally cited Hinata's timid demeanor. Hinata would make an almost perfect clan head's wife, but she lacked the will and determination to be the clan head she was supposed to one day be. In a calm and stoic manner Hiyashi said, yes daughter. Why have you come? Much to Hiyashi's annoyance, Hinata looked down at the ground and meekly replied, Sorry father, but you asked that I tell you how my final test went. My team and I passed our test. While Hiyashi was pleased to hear this expected news, the manner in which it was delivered left much to be desired. If only she had looked at him or at least spoke more confidently. The elder Hyuga let only a measured fraction of his disappointment out as he said, as expected. You may go now. Hinata bowed her head, a bit too low for Hiyashi's preferences, and then slowly moved towards the door. 
Hiashi waited until Hinata was out of earshot, and then he slammed his fist on his desk. What by the ancestors was he doing wrong? Why couldn't he break his daughter out of her shell and bring the strong young woman inside to the surface? Anyone with any common sense could figure out that Hinata had a strong will given her ability to endure the pressure placed on her without complaint or crying. But why oh why couldn't the girl grow a backbone? All Hiashi asked for was for Hinata to speak up on something she felt was important. Even a little defiance would be good if it showed that Hinata could stand up for herself, instead of just folding in like a sack of potatoes. The first two months after Team Hiashi formed were spent training and doing missions. Hiashi had set things up so that the team was on a cycle consisting of one full day training with each other, a day where they were expected to complete 2D rank missions, and then a half day of training as a team. Naruto and Shino both showed solid and steady improvement during this period. Ino had grown the fastest, but she was still below the boys. Her rapid improvement was due to Hiashi pulling her over the side after the first week of training and delivering an ultimatum. Either she could shape up as a Kanoichi, or she could remain boy-obsessed. If she chose the latter, Hiashi would put in the paperwork to have her transferred for Black Widow training. Needless to say, Ino quickly decided that her training was more important than her looks. Currently, Team Hiashi was in the mission room. The genin were calmly standing in front of their instructor as he spoke to the Hokage. Lord Hokage, I respectfully request that my team be allowed to go on a C-rank mission if one is available. Here is in calmly lit his pipe as he discreetly looked over the team's record. The 40D-rank missions and Hiashi's monthly progress reports were impressive. He made his decisions after a few seconds. Your team has my permission. Hiroka, fetch the mission scroll from the Book Merchants Guild that was filed earlier this morning. The scroll was in Hiruzen's hands a few seconds later, allowing the Hokage to read off the mission parameters. Kanoha's chapter of the Book Merchants Guild requests an escort for a shipment of wares from Kanoha to Fire City. Threat level is low with only a minor chance of bandit attack. The mission is estimated to take nine days in order to reach Fire City. Payment will be in full from the Fire City chapter upon the safe arrival of both the merchants and their wares. The merchants are scheduled to depart at 7 a.m. tomorrow from the Northern Gate. They request that you be that their escort arrives no later than 15 minutes before departure. Do you accept the mission? Hiashi nodded his head and replied, as the leader of Team Hiashi, I accept the mission for my team. The Hokage gave the scroll to Hiashi who then promptly led his team out of the tower. Once out of the tower, Hiashi turned around to look at his students. Let your families know about the mission and pack for 15 days. We will meet again at the usual training ground promptly at 6.30 tomorrow morning. You have the rest of the day off. The Hyuga clan head then started walking from his students. He pretended not to hear Naruto and Ino's cheers of excitement. Ninjas, to Hiashi, should be calm and in control of themselves when on duty. As long as the trio did this when they were on the clock, he had no problems with how they acted in their free time. Back with the Genins, Naruto had his fist in the air as he yelled out, all right. Finally. We've got ourselves a real ninja mission. Ino grinned at her comrade's enthusiasm and added her two cents. D ranks may beat what my parents pay me for working in the shop. But, if I had to clean one more clogged sewer drain I'd go nuts. There was a faint grin on Shino's face, showing that the usually stoic young ninja was also excited. However, he quickly acted as the voice of reason for the group. D rank missions may not be enjoyable, but they were safe. While we are on this upcoming mission, we will have no one to count on, but ourselves should something go wrong. Naruto rolled his eyes and then patted Shino on the back. Relax man, this is just a simple escort mission. Missions like this are done all the time by Genin just like us, and most of the time nothing happens. On those rare times when something does happen, it's a bandit or two trying to make a few quick cryo. Now I'm not saying that this will be a breeze, but we were trained to take down bandits back in the academy. Shino nodded his head accepting his teammate's argument. Good point Namikas. However, it would still be foolish to treat this mission as the other missions we've done. I must head home now so good day to the both of you. With that, Shino left the duo and started heading home. The Yamanaka flower shop was between Naruto and his house, so he and Ino continued walking together for a few more minutes. Ino waited until the flower shop came in sight before she spoke again. Hey Naruto, do you think I could borrow a ceiling scroll? I want to bring my poison kit and I don't want to have to lug it to Fire City and back. Naruto was digging into his pockets before Ino could finish her explanation. He pulled a scroll out of his jacket and tossed it to his teammate. Here you go Ino. Just remember that you've got a 20 kilograms weight limit. If you try to stuff anything heavier into that scroll, it will explode. See you tomorrow. It didn't take Naruto long to reach his and Kasumi's house from the flower shop. The young genin opened the front door and saw Kasumi in her favorite chair, slowly sipping a cup of tea. Naruto pretended not to notice the small shaking in his old caretaker's arm as she held the teacup. 
Basumi turned to look at Naruto, and she softly spoke. Hello, Naruto. You're home rather early today. Naruto smiled at his grandmother, and he proudly exclaimed, my team's got a C-rank mission. Sensei let us go home early to prepare for the mission. We leave bright and early tomorrow and should be home in 15 days. There was a soft smile on the elderly woman's face when she heard the news. That's good to hear Naruto. I know that you'll do well on your mission. Kasumi then slowly put her tea down on the small table next to her chair before continuing. Why don't I make your favorite dinner tonight to celebrate? It took the old woman a few seconds to stand up. Once Kasumi was up, she walked towards Naruto and gave him a hug. After the hug was over, the two separated to do their self-appointed tasks. Kasumi headed to the kitchen to get started on preparing Naruto's favorite meal. Naruto headed upstairs and started packing his supplies for the upcoming mission. Once Naruto finished packing, he placed the pack by the door and started reading a book on intermediate ceiling theory. Dean Hiashi showed up at the northern gate exactly at 6.45 the next morning. The genin calmly stood by the gatehouse as Hiashi approached the head of the merchant team. My team and I will be your escort on your journey to Fire City. After saying this, Hiashi pulled out the mission scroll and offered it to the lead merchant. The merchant quickly accepted the scroll and rapidly read it for confirmation. Once the merchant was satisfied he handed the scroll back to Hiashi. Glad to have you guys with us. If you want, you can ride on the wagons. Hiashi nodded his head and then gave his response. Team, I want you to form standard defense formation 5. Ino is to take point with me in front of the first wagon. Naruto and Shino, you two have the second card. It just took the team a few seconds to take their designated positions. While this was going on, the merchants were nodding approvingly at the team's professionalism. They had made this trip many times and were used to breaking in rookie genin teams. None of the book merchants had ever gotten a reason to complain about the genins when it came to the ninja's ability to defend the caravan. However, there was usually a certain naivety among the rookies that was rather grating for the old merchants. The lead merchant waited until after Team Hiashi was in position to begin his final check of the caravan. Once the lead merchant was satisfied, he stood up and gruffly spoke up. All right men, we're wasting daylight so let's move out. The lead merchant then cracked the reins, and the oxen started pulling the wagon. Higher City first came into Team Hiashi's view nine days after they set out from Kanoha. Naruto paused on a hilltop for just a moment to get a good view of the city below. The outer walls of the city were about as high as the walls of Kanoha. Most of the buildings near the walls just had their roofs visible. The taller buildings were more in the center of the city. From his viewing spot it was possible for Naruto to spot some of the major shrines of the city. There was a small rise in the city's elevation towards the southwest end. This was where the daimyo had built his palace complex. Naruto would have looked longer at the capital city. However, that would result in him falling out of formation, and that was something Naruto didn't want. The team had managed to perform its duty of escorting the merchants wonderfully, and Naruto was not about to mess that up after coming so close to finishing the mission. He so smoothly resumed his pace that only Hiashi noticed that the young Namikas had momentarily stopped walking. The merchants quickly led their wagons towards the main gate of Fire City. Hiashi spoke up as the group approached the gate. Remember to have your identification ready and keep a discreet eye on the guards when they check the merchant's wares. Some guards will swipe a few goods from a merchant while checking the convoy. The genin nodded their heads and pulled out their ID cards. The slightly overweight guard walked from the guardhouse and approached the merchants. The guard gruffly addressed the group. All right, I need to see some names and a list of what you've got. Any funny business and the lot of you can spend the rest of the day in a jail cell until the constable can sort you out. It didn't take long for the guard to verify that everything was in order. Of course, the hardened gaze of Hiashi was very useful in speeding up the process. Once the guard checked everything, both the merchants and Team Hiashi were allowed to enter Fire City. Everyone then headed over to the Book Merchants Guild headquarters. The lead merchant turned to Hiashi when they reached the gates of the headquarters and said, Mission accomplished. The money for the mission will be deposited in Kanoha's accounts by the end of the day. Hiashi nodded his head and respectfully answered, It was our pleasure. He then turned to his genin and simply stated, follow me. Naruto, Ino, and Shino nodded their heads and quickly followed their sensei out into the busy streets. Shortly after leaving the guild headquarters, Naruto spoke up, Hiashi where are we going? The young Namikas had initially thought that they would just head back to Kanoha. However, the Hyuga clan leader wasn't leading them the way they had entered the city. Both Ino and Shino waited eagerly in their own manner to hear their teacher's reply. They also wanted to know, but unlike Naruto they weren't about to ask. The Ashi answered his student's question in his typical calm and regal manner. Kanoha has a hall every major city in fire country. These halls allow us to receive missions from more clients and serve as a friendly place to rest after a mission. We are going to go to the Fire City Hall to report the success of our mission and rest for today. We'll start heading back to Kanoha tomorrow. 
it didn't take long for Team Hiyashi to reach Kanoha's hall. The hall itself was a rather simple building that had only two distinguishing features. First, the Kanoha emblem was proudly displayed on banners visible from all four sides. The second distinguishing feature was the high wall and guard towers surrounding the hall. This made the ninja outpost a literal fortress within the commercial sector. Team Hiyashi quickly showed their papers to the guard at the hall's main gate and then were promptly led into the shinobi section of the hall. Once inside, Hiyashi spoke up. The three of you may select any empty room on the genin floor to stay in tonight. But remember, you're only genins so the three of you must share the same room. I'll be on the jonin floor if you need me. You may leave and explore the city if you wish. However, you will be back in the hall by sundown if you decide to go out. Is that understood? The three genins nodded their heads and then walked into the hallway where the genin rooms were located. Ino quickly turned to her teammates and spoke up, alright boys. I'm selecting the room we're staying in. Is that clear? Naruto and Shino both silently nodded their heads. It didn't matter to them which room they stayed in. The boys quickly followed behind Ino as she led them down the hall until she found a room that she liked and wrote the team's name on the chalkboard attached to the door. Once inside, Ino spoke up again. I'm taking the single bed. You two can sort out who gets which bunk on the bunk bed. I'm going to go explore the city and I expect to have the single bed when I get back. After Ino left, Naruto turned to face Shino and asked Top. Shino quickly gave the young Namikas a glare which caused Naruto to sigh. How about rock paper scissors and the winner gets the top? Shino nodded his head and replied, agreed. The two young ninjas quickly started their game for the bunk. A small smug smirk appeared on Shino's face when he won the game. The young bug wielder quickly climbed up the ladder to cement his claim before Naruto could call a rematch. Naruto grudgingly took the lower bunk. For the next couple of hours, the boys quietly read some books that they had brought along. Exactly 15 days after they left, Team Hiyashi returned to Konoha and stood before the Hokage. Hiraz impatiently waited as Hiyashi gave his report. Occasionally, the old leader would nod his head when the Jonin related something of importance. After Hiyashi finished, the Hokage put his pipe down and spoke. So you had a routine escort mission and encountered no threats during the mission. Furthermore, the caravan you were protected arrived on time and the merchants had no cause for complaint from any member of your team. Good job Team Hiyashi. If you keep up the good work I may be willing to let you take more C-rank missions in the future. All members of the team nodded their heads accepting the Hokage's praise. While Shino and Hiyashi kept their usual stoic expressions, Ino and Naruto both started grinning at this news. Hiyashi then asked, is that all sir? Hiruzen nodded his head. Team Hiyashi is dismissed. However, I request that Jen and Namikas stay for the moment. The rest of you may leave. Ino and Shino glanced at their teammate, whose face clearly showed his surprise at the Hokage's request. Hiyashi placed his hand firmly on Naruto's shoulder for a second and then he lead the other two members of the team out of the office. Now alone with the Hokage, Naruto gulped wondering why he was being singled out like this. Sir, why did you request that I stay behind? Here is inside and took off his cage's hat. Naruto, I've got some bad news to tell you. Kasumi passed away while you were out on your mission. The doctors determined that she passed away due to natural organ failure of her lungs while she was sleeping. Naruto's eyes were closed with his face scrunched up and tears freely flowing. He started shaking his head and then screamed out, no. That can't be. Kasumi can't be dead. You've got to be lying. On and on Naruto screamed as he attempted to drain his tear ducts. Flashes of all the good times he had with his grandmother flashed through the young Namikaze's mind. The thought that he would never be able to have another moment with Kasumi tore at his heart. The old Hokage silently let Naruto cry for a few minutes. After all, the boy did need to get it out of his system. Eventually, Hiruzen decided that Naruto had carried on long enough. The Hokage got out of his chair, walked towards Naruto, and firmly put his old hand on the boy's shoulder. That's enough Naruto. Kasumi would not want you to carry on like this. With tears still in his eyes, Naruto looked up at Hiruzen. But grandfather, I can't help it. It just hurts too much. I miss grandma. Hiruzen hunched down so that he and Naruto were eye level. Of course it hurts Naruto. The loss of anyone you care about will hurt, it's part of what being human is all about. However, you must learn to move beyond the hurt and remember all of the good times you had with Kasumi. It's not easy and it will take time, but eventually the pain will subside leaving you with just your fond memories of your times with your grandmother. It's not fair. Naruto pouted as his tears slowed down. Kasumi was a civilian. I'm a ninja. If anyone should have been hurt while I was on the mission it should have been me. The old leader shook his head and then softly replied to his subordinated. Death eventually comes for us all Naruto. This is a fact of life. Kasumi was old. In fact she was almost a decade older than I am. She got to live a long and full life that ended peacefully in her sleep. Do not begrudge the Shinigami for that. 
if one of you had to die, would it be fair for you, who are young and have your life ahead of you, to die and her to live? Slowly, ever so slowly, Naruto's mind came to accept what Hiruzen was telling him. It wouldn't be fair. But, that still doesn't stop the pain. Hiruzen nodded his head. As I said, the pain will ease with time. Why don't you go and find something to do in the village to try and distract yourself for a bit? You could then go back home if you wish, Kasumi left everything she had to you, or you could move into your parents' house. Don't worry about your team, I'm putting Team Hiashi on standby for a week to give you some cooping time. But please Naruto, don't isolate yourself or push away from your friends in your grief. A pain shared is a pain had. Ino was a Kanoichi on a mission. She was currently racing through the streets of Kanoha as fast as she could towards the Aburum compound. The young mindwalker had just heard about Naruto's grandmother's passing from her mom and was determined to find Naruto. However, Ino knew that she was the worst tracker on her team and that Naruto was very good at hiding when he wanted to. Once Ino reached the Aburum compound, she ran up to the main door and started banging on it. A cousin of Shino's, Ino didn't know the man's name, opened the door. The Aburum looked at Ino with a hint of annoyance. What emergency has caused such an expressive greeting? Ino sent the older ninja a frightening glare and she practically screamed out, Team Emergency. Tell Shino that he needs to get his bug-infested butt out here right now. The Aburum didn't need to call Shino, the young man had quite clearly heard his teammates' yells. Shino quickly appeared in the doorway and he calmly stated, what is the matter Ino? Ino quickly grabbed her stoic teammate and yanked him out of his house. Look Shino, I just found out that Naruto's grandmother died which means that he just found out. We're going to go make sure that he's okay and you're going to find him for us. Shino thought about suggesting that they just let Naruto have his space. However, Ino was very persuasive and the bug wielder decided that it was in his best interests to follow her suggestion. My Kikai insects are tracking Naruto as I speak. They will locate him shortly Ino. So, would you please let me down? Why oh why did his teammate have to be so troublesome? There was a small thud when Shino's butt fell on the ground. Luckily for Shino, his Kikai bugs quickly reported back so he wouldn't have to deal with Ino's impatience on top of this indignity. Shino then adjusted his glasses and got off the ground to look the blonde Kanoichi in the eye. Naruto is due west of here. I'll be able to locate him more precisely the closer we get to him. Both genins quickly took off on their hunt for Naruto. Ten minutes later, they found him sitting on a single rope tree swing in one of the smaller parks. Ino and Shino quickly noticed a depressed expression on Naruto's face. It just seemed so wrong for their normally cheerful teammate to be that sad. An unhappy Naruto was as natural as an emo clown. Ino slowly started to approach her teammate and wondered what she should say. She had been so focused on finding Naruto that she hadn't considered what to do once he had been found. Um Naruto, are you alright? The young Kanoichi immediately felt like kicking herself after the words left her mouth. Of course her teammate wasn't alright. That's why she was here in the first place. This was her favorite park. Naruto muttered from the swing. She always used to bring me here when I was little to play. I can still remember the first time I was on the swing. Heck, I can still remember the clothes I was wearing and where all of the other kids were when she gave me that first push. Naruto couldn't continue speaking because of the tears that started pouring out. Ino walked closer to Naruto and pulled him into a hug, letting him cry on her shoulder. The young Yamanaka continued to let her teammate cry on her shoulder as she didn't know any other way to help him. Slowly, the proximity of his friends and teammates allowed Naruto to regain some control. He gently pulled away from Ino and then started scratching the back on his head. Sorry about getting your blouse all wet Ino. The blonde Kanoichi rolled her eyes at her friend's antics. Don't get used to it Naruto. You're not my type. Luckily for Ino, Naruto couldn't see the faint blush that had appeared on her face. Shino chose this moment to step forward. There is no shame in feeling sad Naruto. Miss. Takahashi was a wonderful woman and a good mother to you. It would be distressing if her passing had not affected you so. Naruto looked at his teammates for a few seconds and then gave a small, soft smile. Thanks you too. I really needed a friend after grandpa told me about Kasumi. Ino put her hands on her hips and then playfully shook her head. Well lucky for you Naruto today is a two for one special. The young Kanoichi they turned to Shino and called out, hey Shino. Let's take Naruto over to Ichikara's. AM should be helping out her father today if they're staying with the same schedule. Shino nodded his head in agreement. The Raymond restaurant was always busy on the days when the Ichiha matriarch took a turn in the kitchen. Keeping Naruto around people in one of his favorite places would be a wise thing to do in this situation. The only thing Shino didn't like was how empty his pocketbook was likely going to be after this was all over. Still, it was only money and this was for his friend's well-being. Team Hiashi was hard at work training in one of the many practice fields of Konoha. Currently, Hiashi and Ino were watching as Shino and Naruto took a turn sparing. 
Naruto was wielding his bow staff while Shino used a kusurigama, a sickle with a ball and chain attached. Currently, the boys were working on their skill with their main weapons. The Ashi had his Byakugan activated in order to make sure that neither boy used any chakra to enhance their abilities. The Ashi nodded as Naruto ducked under Shino's swing with the ball and then used his staff to ensnare the chain. Remember to pay very close attention to your teammate's movements Eno. The bow staff is a very useful weapon for a ninja as it grants the user both offensive and defensive abilities in equal measure. The Kusurigama emphasizes offensive action for both its attack and to defend the user. The Kusurigama has a longer range than a staff, but it also is harder to disguise. You will need to think of these issues if you choose to select a personal weapon to augment your abilities. Naruto finished the fight by punching Shino in the head, just as Hiyashi was finished speaking. The wide-eyed Jonin instructor stood up and looked at the two young shinobi in front of him. Victory for the spar goes to Naruto. However, it would be wise for you in the future Naruto to not punch your opponent like that in a real fight. Had Shino not been forbidden, he could have used the personal contact to transfer his kakai insects onto you. Such an event would more likely than not result in you joining him in defeat shortly afterward. Still, your technique was good like expected and you handled yourself very well for your current level of training. The Ashi then turned to Shino and gave his critique of the bug wielder's performance. Your performance Shino was proficient as expected. Your execution of standard beginning and intermediate katas with the kusurigama was exactly as should be done. However, that in and of itself is a problem. Katas are for practicing and switching between moves, they are not meant for fighting. You lapsed into a preset kata three times during your spar. I will admit that you lapse far less than most genins of your skill level with the kusurigama would, but falling into preset form even once in a life or death match will get you killed. Still, your skill is enough that you can defend yourself from the typical genin with your current abilities. Both boys bowed to their instructor and then gave each other a polite nod. They then put their weapons away in storage seals. Once the weapons were sealed, both boys headed towards their third teammate and their sensei. Naruto turned his head while he was walking and then cheerfully told Shino, so what's the count? I highly doubt you lost count of our win-loss ratio Naruto. Shino calmly stated this without turning to look at his comrade. Seriously Shino, I don't exactly keep track of that sort of stuff. Well, not in my head. I've got a scorecard back home, but it's not like I can just summon it to me now. It did not surprise Shino at all that Naruto had a scorecard. Naruto wasn't a braggart by any stretch of the imagination. His dream for the future might be to become greater than his father, but that was normal for young men. Most likely, Shino figured, Naruto kept a record of his wins and losses to spur himself into doing better in the future. The Ashi spoke after the boys were right in front of him. Training for today is almost over. However, I want each of you to state what your skills are and any new techniques you've learned on your own over the past month. As part of a team, it is imperative that you are aware of exactly what you and your teammates are capable of. Ino, you will start off and then Naruto can't speak. Ino nodded her head and began her explanation. As you guys know, I've got decent tojutsu. My skills with kunai and shuriken are average. I've also been practicing with senbin needles as I mentioned last month, and currently my skill with the needles is higher than my skill with kunai or shuriken. I currently have a lot of skill in basic poisons and have been starting to learn about intermediate level poisons. I also have a decent level of skill in some basic jinjutsus, and I'm great with the shintenshin jutsu. Naruto then took over for Mino. Okay, I've got good tojutsu and great bajutsu. My skill at throwing kunai and shuriken is good but not great. Currently, I'm one of the best sealmakers in the village, but that's not saying much as most people barely learn how to make exploding tags and basic storage seals. Currently, I know four jutsus besides the academy ones. These are Fuitin. Datapa, Fuitin. Repishu, Katen. Kakakyu, and Cage Bunshin. Finally, Shino took his turn at explaining his skills. My main skills focus on the use of my kakai insects. With my allies I am able to attack enemies, defend teammates, and track almost any target I may be called on to track. In addition, I have refined the basic required genin skill set and my kusurigama training. The Ashi wait a few seconds after Shino finished before he addressed his students again. Today's team training is over. I expect you all to report here promptly at 7 tomorrow morning so that we can receive a mission. The Hyuga clan head then quietly left the training field. Ino sighed and then stated, glad that's over, if Sensei had decided to make this an extra long training session, I wouldn't be able to get to the market before closing bell. Fashion First is having a sale on a shipment from Honey Country, and I don't intend to be the only girl on the block to not have a new Honey outfit. Hey Shino and Naruto, would you mind coming with me and helping me select my outfit? The young Mindwalker turned around to check on her pack mules, only to see falling leaves. 
A tick appeared on Ino's forehead, and she shouted out, Hey you jerks, why didn't you mention you could do the Shunshin Jutsu? The next day Team Hiyashi showed up at the Hokage Tower to receive a mission. Shino and Naruto were both sporting a rather large bump on their heads courtesy of Ino. She had still been steamed that morning over their disappearing act, but the boys thought that it was a bargain price for getting out of shopping with her. They were shinobi, not glorified baggage holders. Hiruzen was sitting at the desk giving out missions when Team Hiyashi came up. Hiyashi bowed his head to Hiruzen and said, Lord Hokage, I respectfully request a mission for my team. The old Hokage nodded his head slightly in acceptance and then looked at the mission list for the day. Hiruzen spotted one particular mission, briefly glanced at Naruto, and then nodded his head slightly. There is a mission that I think your team is well suited for Hiyashi. It's a B-rank mission, but threat level is minimal. This mission, if you chose to accept it, is to journey to Iwa in order to deliver the invitations to the Chunin exams and then to escort the Iwa applicants to Konoha for the exam next month. Much to Ino and Shino's surprise, Hiyashi glanced at Naruto as if he was silently asking the young genin what he thought about the mission. Naruto then shocked his fellow genin by speaking to the Hokage. Sir, is our suitability for this mission due to the Tenjuin clan? Hiruzen quickly answered his subordinate. Officially, the Tenjuin have nothing to do with this mission. Unofficially, both the Tsuchikage and the Tenjuin clan head have preferences on who is on our escort team. The Ashi then spoke up understood sir. As the leader of Team Hiashi I accept this mission. What is the departure time? The Hokage took a puff of his pipe and then answered, the departure time is as soon as your team is ready for a month-long diplomatic mission. Funds for lodging while in Iowa will not need to be drawn from the treasury. Due to certain circumstances, here is in pause to once again glance at Naruto, the Tenjuin clan will be hosting your team during you stay in Iowa. The Ashi nodded his head and then received the relevant documents for the mission from the Hokage. He then led his team out of the Hokage tower and stated, pack your supplies and we'll meet up at the western gate in four hours. Hiyashi then left to make his own preparations for the mission. Naruto was about to leave so that he could do the same. However, Ino grabbed Naruto's collar and turned her fellow blonde to face his teammates. All right Naruto, Ino practically growled out, start talking. The young Namika's heir tried to play dumb. Huh, what are you talking about Ino? Ino gave Naruto a rough tug on the collar to pull him closer. I'm talking about you and this mission Naruto. Just who are the Tenjuin and why are you so concerned about them? Furthermore, why does your presence on this mission mean that we'll be staying with an Iwa clan instead of at a hotel? Shino surprised both blondes by suddenly speaking up. I've heard of the Tenjuin clan before. My father mentioned that they were infamously known as the Golem Generals because of their clan techniques. Furthermore, they are one of the three original founding clans of Iowa, along with the Mudo and the Kaiba clans. The only other thing I know about them is that the late wife of the current Tsuchikage was a Tenjuin. Ino nodded her head and replied, thanks for the info Shino. Still, that doesn't explain why Naruto here is so concerned about them. So once again Naruto, you'd better start talking. Naruto sighed and held up his hands in defeat. Alright, alright, I'll talk. The reason why I was so concerned about the Tenjuin and the reason they're letting us stay at their estate is simple. My fiancé is the daughter of the Tenjuin clan head. The blonde mind reader let go of her comrade in shock. She then stuttered out, fiancé. Shino looked unsettled and mildly surprised when he heard Naruto say that he was engaged. Of course, this meant that Shino was actually completely shocked. Naruto sighed and then proceeded to explain things to his teammates. It's part of the treaty that ended the Third Shinobi War. My marriage was arranged before I was even born, had I been a girl I would have been engaged to my fiancé's older brother instead. Ino tried to wrap her mind around what her friend was telling her. She then started to get angry and demanded, why didn't you tell us sooner? We're your teammates, don't you think that I deserve to know about something like this? Ino was so upset about this that she didn't even realize that she had slipped up. The young man in question quickly replied, I found out when I was six years old. There was no way I was going to mention it then, because I would have been constantly teased about it by the rest of the boys. As I got older I figured that it was a private matter and didn't need to be known to everyone. Sorry if it hurts your feelings, but neither of you needed to know about this until now, so I didn't tell you. Shino walked over to Naruto and firmly placed his hand on the boy's shoulder. He then gave his teammate a slight nod and then removed the hand. The insect wielder then received a nod from Naruto. Both boys were now clear that everything was alright between them. Ino on the other hand remained silent as she stared at Naruto and tried to process what he had said. Wasn't she Naruto's friend and teammate? Why hadn't he trusted her with this news? This confusion only added to the turmoil that was brewing in her heart. Team Hiyashi was currently standing in the lobby of an inn located in a small town 11 kilometers away from Iowa. The team still had to obey the treaty and wait for an escort into Iowa, even though their mission was a diplomatic one. 
Hiashi and Shino were patiently sipping some tea while they waited, Naruto was drumming his fingers against the table, and Ino was in a bad mood. Actually, the blonde-haired girl had been in a bad mood all week, but her teammates weren't about to point that out. Soon enough, a man wearing a jonin vest and an Iwa headband approached the quartet. The main politely bowed his head to Hiashi and said, I take you that you are the courier team from Konoha. Hiashi nodded his head. That we are. I take it that you are part of our escort to Iowa. The Iowa Jonin curtly nodded his head again. I am Ryo Marifuti. My Genin team and I have been tasked with seeing you to our village. If you will follow me I will lead you to my team. With that, Ryo promptly turned around and started walking towards the door. Team Hiashi quickly got out of their seats and followed Ryo. Naruto stopped in mid-step when he exited the inn. His eyes instantly focused on one genin on Ryo's team. His fiance Asuka. She was even more beautiful in real life than in her photo. The first aspect of her that drew Naruto's attention was her face. It seemed to be set in a half-serious expression that could allow her to smile or fight in an instant. After a few seconds, Naruto's gaze sifted allowing him to look at the rest of her. Asuka was wearing a sleeveless white blouse with blue highlights, a blue miniskirt that was just perfect for letting her distract opponents, and blue fingerless gloves that almost came up to her elbows. At first glance one would have trouble believing that she was a Kanoichi from her outfit, except for her headband and shuriken pouch on her leg. However, Jiraiya had taught Naruto to not underestimate Kinoichi, and so he was able to spot the hidden weapons and supplies that were hidden. At the same time, Asuka's gaze was locked onto Naruto. She also instantly recognized him since she had his picture by her bed. Her eyes carefully glanced over him noting the signs indicating that he would be both strong and handsome one day. At the moment he was good for his age and cute. She also noted that he was looking at her and was flattered that he found her attractive without acting like a pervert. Of course, she knew that he wasn't from what he wrote, but a girl couldn't be too sure. This private moment between the two ended when Fubuki Tenjuin placed a hand on his sister's shoulder. Hey sis, couldn't you at least wait until we get home before you and your future hubby get all upstruck? Asuka quickly turned to glare at her joker of a big brother. She would have done more, but Ryo spoke up with a hint of annoyance. As I was saying, these are my genin students. From left to right we have Asuka Tenjuin, Fubuki Tenjuin, and Daichi Misawa. Each of my students is to be paired with a Kanoha Genin until we reach Iowa and that Tsuchikage finalizes your stay. The Ashi nodded his head and quickly gave out orders to his Genin. Naruto, you are to stay with Asuka. Shino, you are to stick close to Fubuki. Ino, keep close to Daichi. These arrangements would have normally called for Asuka and Ino to be partnered up. However, Hiashi wasn't blind and he knew Ino wasn't in the best of moods over her teammate status. Ryo nodded his head to confirm the arrangement and then the eight ninjas proceeded to Iowa. The first eight kilometers of the journey were simple for the ninjas as they just traveled through the trees. But, things abruptly changed for the last two kilometers towards Iowa. At this point the forest gave way to a jaggy mountain range. Ryo signaled for everyone to stop, and then he addressed the Kanoha ninjas. These mountains contain heavy deposits of mithrilite, a mineral that is resistant to chakra. This makes walk walking on the mountain deadly unless you know exactly where the mithrilite deposits aren't in high concentrations. From this point on we walk. True to Ryo's word, the eight ninjas had to walk the last two kilometers to Iwa over winding paths that were little better than goat trails. The trails served Iwa as the wall around the village did for Kanoha. You literally had to walk single file most of the way there or fall off a cliff. Occasionally, there was a watchtower that had to be passed or a drawbridge that one had to go over. Naruto and the other Kanoha ninjas had to privately admit that the village hidden in the mountains was in a more defensible position than Kanoha was. The trade-off to this was that it must be a horrendous task to keep Iowa properly supplied. Eventually, the eight ninjas completed the treacherous track to reach Iowa. Ryo's team then promptly lead Team Hiashi to the Tsuchikage Hall to meet with the village's cage. Inoki was sitting at his desk fighting the bane of all leaders, paperwork, when the eight were let in. The old leader looked up at Ryo and barked, I was expecting you a few minutes ago. Ryo deeply bowed and apologized, I'm terribly sorry sir. However, we were delayed due to the Kanoha ninja's unfamiliarity with the paths to our village. Anoki got up on his desk and muttered to himself. Well, I suppose that's a good reason for being late. Don't want foreign ninja knowing their way around these mountains after all. The Tsuchikage then hopped off his desk, straightened out his back, and then turned to Hiashi. Alright you overgrown brat, why are you here? For a split second Hiashi's face betrayed his annoyance before his self-control took over. We were sent to bring Iwa its invitation to the Chunin exams being held in Kanoha and to escort your contestants back to Kanoha. Hiashi then reached into his jacket, pulled out the invitation, and handed it to Inoki. The old cage quickly opened the invitation and began to read it. He nodded his head a few times and then threw the document onto his leaning tower of paperwork to do. Inoki then turned around and waved off everyone. 
I'll have the list of applicants by the end of the week. In the meantime, I'd suggest that you Konoha ninjas stay out of trouble. Asuka and Fubuki, see to it that our village's guests make it safely to your family's manor. Both siblings bowed their heads. Yes uncle, they both said at the same time. Ino immediately did a double take and then glared at Naruto. The other blonde of Team Hiyashi simply nodded his head. He then wished he had fainted ignorance because of the promise of pain on Ino's face. Why oh why was she upset with him over this fact? That Tsuchikij had started the engagement clause in the treaty, so was it any surprise that he'd be related to the Iwa party. Neither Tenjuan sibling seemed to pay any attention to the drama occurring in Team Hiyashi, as then moved towards the door. They then left the room with the Konoha ninjas following them while their teammates went somewhere else. The six walked through the main streets of Iowa for a while, until they reach a set of steps that lead down to a carved plateau. Everyone then passed by several carved arena areas as they made their way to the single tower on the plateau. Yubuki then turned around. Welcome to our not-so-humble home. We'll just need to check in with father in order to see what wing and floor has been prepared for you all to stay in while you're here. Fubuki then grabbed Naruto into a headlock and whispered, a word of caution for you, my soon-to-be little brother. Father seems to know everything that happens in the house, so it's best for you and sis to be outside if you want to make out. The blush quickly formed on Naruto's face, and then he promptly elbowed Fubuki in the gut. Asuka shook her head in embarrassment at her brother's actions. She then bowed to Hiyashi, please forgive my brother's rudeness sir. He's a very competent ninja for his age, but he likes to goof off when not on duty. Let me lead you to my parents. Asuka then quickly lead everyone into the house before Fubuki could embarrass her anymore. The sunset here in Iowa was magnificent. Naruto could privately admit that to himself as he watched as the red and orange hues danced across the mountains. Currently, the young Namikas was sitting on the balcony ledge attached to his room. If he glanced down and to the right he could just barely spot the window of Shino's room. Unlike his teammates, Naruto's quarters were on the family level instead of the guest level. Naruto turned his head from side of the mountains when he heard the door to his room open. He then listened as someone quickly but lightly walked to the door to the balcony and Asuka came out. She promptly walked over the ledge and rested her elbows on it. The two then turned and looked at each other, wondering what they should do as they realized that this was the first time they had been alone with each other. Silently, the duo tried to sort out their feelings and think about what they each should do. Finally, Naruto broke the silence. Am I as bad in person as I seem to be in my letters? A small smile formed on Asuka's face. You didn't seem like a bad person at all in your letters Naruto. Now that I've met you in person I think that you're even better than I had thought. What about me? How do I compare with the Asuka you built up in your mind? Naruto also smiled as he replied, what I've seen so far has shown me that you're at least as great as I thought. From what I can tell your skills as a ninja are good. Although, I would like a spar to see exactly how good you are for myself. Also, you're even more beautiful than your photo showed. Asuka nodded her head to accept Naruto's words. She then sighed as she looked out on the mountains. I'll miss this when it comes time for our marriage. I'm sure that there are some lovely spots around Konoha, but I do so love looking at the mountains, especially at this time. Naruto led it over and gently placed a hand on Asuka's shoulder. Don't worry, our marriage isn't for two more years yet. That means you have two whole years to look at the mountains. Part of the sadness Asuka felt at the though of permanently leaving her home vanished at Naruto's words. However, a part of it still remained to bug her. But Naruto, those two years are the longest that the marriage will be held off. Don't you remember the conditions of the treaty? Our marriage will take place when either we're either 16 or both Chunin, whichever comes first. We could end up married in less than two months. Privately, Naruto had to admit that such a possibility was true, but more likely than not remote. That would only happen if we both became Chunin at the upcoming exam Asuka. Now I'm sure that your skills are good enough for you to get the title if your team is sent. However, I'm still a rookie Genin. It's extremely unlikely that Hiyashi will enter my team into the exams. Even if he did, it would be even more unlikely that I'd be promoted. I'm very good for my experience level, but that's still a lower level than most of the contestants at the exam. So you see, you don't have to worry about us getting married in the next couple of months. The full smile graced Asuka's face when she heard Naruto's comforting words. Thank you Naruto. The two of them then silently watched as the sun finished setting. In the peaceful silence of the sun's decent the two who were both strangers and very close friends to each other were able to find a common bond. They whose paths were set to cross for so long knew that they would be able to make their future marriage work. This they each promised themselves for both each other's happiness and the future of their villages. Ino was having a tough time getting to sleep. She always had a tough time getting to sleep whenever she wasn't in her bed back home. Personally, Ino blamed the academy and their situational awareness training summer camp. 
Who was the sadistic jerk that came up with the idea of having students camp out in the forest while the instructors sneak about and pour cold paint on the students? Meanwhile, back in Kanoha Ruka started sneezing. Just as Ino was finally getting comfortable, she heard something faintly echoing. The young mindreader instantly got up and listened for the sound. She quickly heard the faint sound of someone walking about upstairs. Furthermore, the sound seemed to be moving towards Naruto's room. Curious and a bit worried for her teammate, Ino got up and crept out of her room. She quickly headed to the stairs and then silently walked up them to the family level. The young Yamanaka reached the top of the stairs just in time to see someone open the door to Naruto's room. She couldn't see who had entered because the door was in her line of sight. For a split second Ino hesitated over what she should do. On the one hand, she was not supposed to be up here without being escorted by a member of the Tenjounin clan. On the other hand, she was already up here and something had to be happening to Naruto. It didn't take Ino long to make up her mind. She quickly snuck over to the door and peered inside Naruto's room. To Ino's surprise and worry Asuka was standing in Naruto's room holding a candle holder with a large lit candle on in. What by Benton could she possibly be doing? That was the question on Ino's mind. Asuka walked to the foot of Naruto's bed where there was a cabinet drawer and a small edge. She then put her candle down on the ledge, opened the drawer, and pulled out two candles. The candles were paced on opposite ends of the ledge, and then the lit candle was gently picked up. Asuka gulped for a second and then calmed herself down. It wouldn't be right to be nervous with what she had to do. Naruto's fiancé then began to quietly chant, her chanting was so low that Ino could barely make out Asuka's words. Hear my plea, O ancestors of mine for I have great need of your wisdom. The one who lays here before me claims me by way of peace bond between his people and mine. As a daughter of the Tenjounin clan and Saikon of the Tenjeri people, I beseech your aid in judging this claim. Asuka lit the candle on the right and then placed her original on the ledge. She then took up the newly lit candle and started walking along the right side of Naruto's bed. I present to you, ye who bore she who bore me, Naruto the child of Kishina. May your spirits come here this night to judge his worthiness. Does he meet with your approval? Do you foresee him as a good man for my hand? Is his seed fit to be planted in my womb? Should he be trusted with lordship over me? After saying this, Asuka gently placed the candle on the right side of the ledge above Naruto's head and then walked back to the foot of the bed. She then lit the other candle and walked along the left side of Naruto's bed. I present to you, ye who provided for he who provided for me, Naruto the son of Minato. May your spirits come here this night to judge his worthiness. Does he meet with your approval? Do you trust him with the honor of your lineage? Is he capable of providing for me and my young? Should he be given my heart and body? Asuka then placed the candle on the left side of the ledge and headed back to the foot of the bed. Once at the foot of the bed, Asuka picked up her original candle and slowly moved it counterclockwise. Let my ancestors' spirits cast their judgment, O oh great lord of Yomi. Let my dreams disclose that which they have decided. What they decide I will do. Asuka then placed the candle at the center of the foot ledge, back a few steps away from Naruto's bed, and bowed her head seven times. Ino noticed that Asuka was moving to leave and quickly pressed her back against the wall hiding behind the door. She remained silent as Asuka walked out of Naruto's room and then headed across the room. Asuka then entered her room and closed the door. Ino waited a few minutes for Asuka to stop moving and then snuck back down to her own room. All the while, Ino was wondering what she had just witnessed. Asuka woke up as the first rays of sunlight came through her window and touched her bed. The Tenjuanera sprang up from her pillow with a heavy blush on her cheeks. She quickly got out of bed, grabbed a robe, then picked up a change of clothes and left her room for the manor's main baths. While each bedroom on the family wing had its own bath, they paled in comparison to the main baths. Asuka quickly made use of a private set of stairs that lead from the family level to where the baths were located. This staircase had been built in the original design of the family manor because Asuka's great-grandfather thought it was tacky for the family to have to walk through the guest level to get to the baths. When Asuka opened the door to the women's bath, she found that her mother Kawai was already enjoying the baths. Kawai glanced over to her daughter and smiled, put down your things already Asuka and come on in. The younger Tenjuan smiled and called out, just a second mom. She then quickly stored her things and joined her mother in bath. The bath itself was crafted to look like it was a hot spring instead of just being a simple bath. Mother and daughter then quietly proceeded to clean themselves. Towards the end of the bath, Kawai spoke up again. Would you like me to take care of your hair Asuka? Sure mother. Kawai quickly started to wash Asuka's hair. Once she was sure her daughter was relaxed enough, the Tenjounin matriarch spoke up. So daughter, what was the dream your ancestors sent to you about Naruto? What? Mother, how could you just ask that? Asuka couldn't believe that her mother had just done that. Awai simply smiled and continued to wash her daughter's hair. Oh come now my little Asuka. There's no need to hide what the ancestors showed you. 
Talking about the vision helps one to understand what one's ancestors are trying to say. It's just the two of us here and I promise not to whisper a word about what your vision held. Asuka thought about what her mother was saying and had to admit that there was some truth to her words. Talking about the vision would help her understand it better. However, did she really want to talk about something like that with her mother? On the other hand, who else was she going to talk to about the vision? Her two friends from the institute were out. They meant well, but those two could be such blabbermouths at times. But the small sigh, Asuka began to talk about her vision. I was in a meadow by the edge of a forest when I spotted a fox being chased by a pack of wolves. The fox kept on playing tricks until the last of the wolves was left unconscious just outside the meadow. I then watched as the fox came into the meadow carrying several rabbits in its mouth. He then led me towards the opening of a burrow. The next thing I can recall is being inside the burrow lying on a soft rug and feeling a warm sense of comfort. Asuka's face quickly turned cherry red as she continued on with a vision. That same fox quickly appeared again only this time he was on me. The, the fox then started licking me and then took me on the rug. She then quietly whispered, I thought I was going to pass out from the pleasure Asuka's voice then returned to her normal volume. Soon afterwards I found myself nursing some kits while the fox lay next to me and occasionally passed me something to eat. To Asuka's shock and surprise, Kawai suddenly picked her up and twilled her around in a circle shouting, Oh my little Asuka, I'm so happy for you. The younger Tenjuan woman was blinking her eyes in shock as Kawai set her down. Huh? What do you mean mother? This wasn't the reaction Asuka had been expecting at all. Well, she honestly didn't know how she expected her mother to react, but this definitely wasn't it. Kawai simply grinned and replied, silly girl, don't you realize just how favorably your ancestors look on your match? The fox in your vision obviously is a symbol for your betrothed given his circumstances. Asuka and her parents were the only people in Iowa besides from the Tushikage who knew about the Kayubi. They had been informed given their connection to Naruto by the Tushikage himself in private. What you saw in the meadow was your forefathers showing that they believe Naruto can deal with threats before they reach home and he has the ability to provide for you. The burrow part of the vision obviously comes from our female ancestors. That part of the vision shows that you'll have a loving home, a good time in the sack, and that Naruto won't mind helping you with any future children you might have. All in all daughter dear, you've gotten yourself a glowing endorsement on Naruto, and that's why I'm so happy for you. What her mother said quickly made sense to Asuka. The vision was a ringing endorsement from her ancestors, and what mother wouldn't want a good endorsement for her daughter's future husband? Asuka quickly bowed her head and said, thank you mother for helping me with understanding the vision. Kawai gave Asuka a brief kiss on the forehead in reply, and then the two finished their bath. Ryuji Tenjuin, head of the Tenjuin clan and a leading candidate to be Inoki's successor, serenely walked towards his clan's training grounds, where Team Hiashi was practicing. Hiashi was having his genin do various calisthenics and cardio exercises. These were very good exercises for ninjas that were in neutral territory and had to worry about any secret techniques being stolen. The Ashi motioned for his students to stop after he felt that they had showed off enough for their host. The Hyuga clan head then turned to face his counterpart and politely nodded his head in respect. Ryuji returned the gesture and then stated, a very fit team you have here sir. Thank you sir, I like to think that they have advanced to an acceptable level for rookie genin. I had expected them to have reached a higher level given the training they've undergone, but their current level is tolerable. Both clan leaders grinned at Hiashi's words and the glares the genin were sending their teacher. What better way was there to motivate someone than to compliment their efforts and then immediately take back the compliment. Ryuji then tilted decided to reveal why he had come to the training grounds. Lord Hyuga, an escort has arrived to bring you to the Tsuchikage. I have been told that this is so he can give you the list of our participants in the upcoming exams. The Ashi nodded his head. Thank you for informing me of this Lord Tenjun. Is there anything else that I need to be informed about or may I go see the Tsuchikage? The Tenjuan clan head paused for a second and then replied, yes there is. Would you mind if I talk to Jen and Namikas in private while you are away? That is acceptable to me. Naruto quickly moved towards Ryuji as Hiashi started to walk towards the Tenjuan estate exit. Both Ino and Shino glanced at their teammate with curious looks in their eyes. Naruto simply grinned at them which caused the duo to resume their training. Ryuji then motioned for Naruto to follow him and the young Namikas complied. The future father-son-in-law duo started walking towards the wall that lined the cliff edge surrounding the Tenjuan estate. Once they were out of anyone else's earshot, Ryuji stopped walking and looked Naruto in the eye. Ryo Marifugi has nominated his team for the exams and that Tsuchikage has accepted the nomination. I would consider it a personal favor if you would agree to house my children and the rest of their team while they are in Konoha. Naruto quickly nodded his head and replied, no problem. As far as I'm concerned, the entire Tenjuan clan has a permanent invitation to stay with me while visiting Konoha. 
Naruto then frowned and put his hand under his chin. Ryuji, why did you pull me over like this? I mean, you could have simply asked about this invitation in front of my teammates. Ryuji sighed and nodded his head to concede Naruto's point. You are correct Naruto. I wanted to talk to you in private because there are things of a sensitive nature that I have to talk to you about. To be blunt, what will my daughter be in your house? Huh? Why would you need to ask me that? She's to be my wife like you and your uncle agreed to with my father. The frown appeared on Ryuji's face as he analyzed Naruto's reactions. Part of him wanted to take the honest boy at his word. However, the father within him refused to drop this interrogation until he was satisfied. This was his daughter's future happiness that he was checking on after all. In a hardened manner, Ryuji continued his investigation. That agreement is a formality between nations, I desire what will happen between you and my daughter. Are you going honestly accept her as your wife or will she be your wife in name only? Is she going to be a part of your life or merely a stranger staying in the same house? Will she be the mother of your children or will you leave her barren in favor of having children by concubines from your village? It was quite obvious from the shocked look on Naruto's face that he hadn't considered these possibilities. The young genin blurted out, I thought that she'd be my wife like a regular married couple. You know be there for each other and maybe have a few kids one day when we're ready. Where are you getting all of these ideas from? Ryuji smiled and placed a hand on Naruto's shoulder. You don't know how relieved I am to hear you say that Naruto. You weren't considering any of these situations and for that I am truly grateful. A father cannot help but worry about his daughter's happiness. Especially in a situation like you and Asuka are in. I initially agreed to the betrothal because it was a way to help ensure the peace for the land of earth. However, that did not mean that I was comfortable with this arrangement. I was the one who initially pushed for you and my daughter to become pen pals. This was done because I didn't want my daughter to marry a stranger and I wanted a way to check on what kind of man you were becoming. My preference for your team escorting our genin for the upcoming Chunin exams was because I wanted to judge who you were in person. That and I wanted to give Asuka the chance to perform the ceremony of ancestral acceptation which I have been told you passed. Still, I had to question you for myself about what kind of marriage Asuka would look forward to having. Naruto nodded his head accepting Ryuji's words. Both Jiraiya and Hiashi had occasionally mentioned that one of the most important responsibilities of a good clan head was looking out for the other members of the clan. So, it was only natural that Asuka's father would be looking out for her. After thinking about everything, Naruto looked up at Ryuji. What would you have done if I didn't meet your expectations? Ryuji's face became deadly serious and he spoke without remorse. I would have killed you where you stand, Naruto. My one flaw, if you would call it that, as a ninja is that I care far more about my family than I do for this nation or this village. If such an action had been necessary I would no doubt be executed as well to appease the land of fire. However, choosing between the happiness of my daughter and my life is no choice at all. Luckily, you were the kind of man that you appeared to be, and such speculation is rendered pointless. It took Team Hiashi and the three teams they were escorting 10 days to reach Kanoha. The 16 ninjas caused a bit of a stir when they walked in the western gate. More precisely, Naruto and Asuka caused a stir when a fangirl spotted the two walking next to each other. Naruto spotted the girl in question and simply rolled his eyes. The girl in question might not be one of his fangirls, but she'd no doubt spread the news about Asuka to everyone within the hour. The troop of ninjas started to split up once everyone was checked out at the gates. Both Iwa teams who didn't have an invitation to the Namika's compound headed off to check out hotel rooms. Ryo quickly left to go to a briefing being given to all four in Jonin about what was acceptable while in Kanoha. Hiashi spoke up just after Ryo left. I want my students to meet up at our usual training ground in three hours. I need to inform the Hokage about our mission success and inform him that you three will be given the chance to enter the exams. You'll need to meet me as scheduled in order to receive the permission form to enter. With that said, Hiashi left his three stunned students in the road. Yubuki grinned at the three Kanoha genin. Well, 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 looks like we made the correct call to not show you three what we're capable of. After all, only an idiot shows an adversary what they can do before they fight. Naruto came out of his stupor before his teammates and gave his future brother a pointed look. Only a fool picks a fight when he doesn't have to. Dachi, the last member of Team Ryo, folded his arms across his chest. Are you proposing that we form an alliance during the exam Namikas? Naruto nodded his head, my godfather has repeatedly told me that part of the exams involves some type of simulated mission. A team of six ninjas would have a higher chance of success against an unknown mission than two separate teams of three ninjas, each doing the same mission. The three Iwa Genin looked at each other silently considering Naruto's proposition. Asuka shrugged her shoulders and voiced her opinion. It would give us more manpower to accomplish whatever task we're given. Seeing an opening, Fubuki gave his sister a hug with one arm and replied in a teasing tone. 
Now, now sissy poo, I fully understand that you want to hang out with your betrothed as much as possible. But, don't you think that this is taking it a little too far? I mean, why should we babysit the greenhorns just so you have some necking time with Naruto? Both Naruto and Asuka's cheeks turned a little pink at Fabuki's not so subtle teasing. The young Namakas couldn't do anything other than take the teasing, because as far as he could see any other action would only make the situation more embarrassing. Luckily for the duo, Asuka was able to find a more elegant solution to their predicament. She simply elbowed her brother in the stomach and muttered, get a hold of yourself Yubuki. Shino then chose this moment to speak up. He Ashi would not have nominated us to the exams if he wasn't convinced that we meet at least the minimum standards that potential Chunin have. Logically, our teaming up would increase both teams' odds of success, especially when you consider that an Iwa Kanoha alliance would be unexpected. Dachi nodded his head and turned towards his teammates. The Aburam has a good point. Teaming up with them would be in our best interests. At least, it would be during the mock mission portion of the exam. Babuki nodded his head and walked towards Naruto. He then put his hand out. So it's agreed that our teams will be allies until we have to face each other in the exam. Ino and Shino quickly glanced at Naruto and nodded their heads. With their acceptance, Naruto took Fubuki's offered hand. Agreed, Team Hiashi and Team Ryo are now allies in the Chunin exams. Hiruzen Saratobi was calmly sitting in his office enjoying a rare break when the door opened. The Hokage then watched as Itachi Ichiha walked into the room with a very concerned expression on his firm face. Itachi walked over to Hiruzen and politely nodded his head. Sir, I've just gotten back from briefing the foreign jonin, and I must state that I have some concerns. The old leader took a puff from his pipe and then set the pipe down. What are your concerns Itachi? Surely the other jonin know how to act when visiting another village under a flag of peace. While Hiruzen's outward appearance was calm, he was worried on the inside. Itachi was one of, if not the best jonin currently serving Kanoha. Any concerns he might have about the village's security deserved the utmost consideration. Itachi put his hand on Hiruzen's desk and activated the strongest hidden security seal in the office that Jonins were allowed to know about. We have two foreign Jinchuriki inside the village at this very moment. One is the Hachibi's container who is a Jonin instructor for one of Kumo's two teams in the exams. The other is the Achibi's container who is a member of Suna's team. Were you aware of their presence within the village? Hiruzen nodded his head and replied, I've been aware of both containers' identities since before the Kazakiage, and Reikage informed me who their participants in this period's Chunin exams were. It was rather rude of Suna to not inform me that their Jinchuriki would be arriving as per the Harashirama Accord, but they might not have felt the need, since they have never hidden who their container is. As long as they do not break any laws I see no reason to worry about their presence in the village any farther than the standard caution given when a powerful foreign ninja is around. The Ichiha clan leader nodded his head accepting Hiruzen's reasoning on the presence of the Jinchuriki. However, there was something that didn't sit well with Itachi on this whole issue. Why weren't we informed about their presence prior to the nomination of the Genin? The nature of the test changes in intensity when a container is involved as is the case of the Ichibi. A somber expression formed on Herzuin's face as he answered Itachi. Does it change Itachi? You know as a commander that you will often have to make tough decisions without having every scrap of information on a situation. Your soldiers in the field will discover information in the field that will change how the mission is to be carried out, and they will have to adapt. Adaptability and dealing with the unknown are two essential elements of being a ninja. I withheld this information in order to give our hopeful Chunin a chance to truly learn this lesson in a situation that we can control. Furthermore, they'll be learning these lessons in a situation that provides an extraction for them to proper medical facilities if things go sour. Hiruzen then got out of his chair and walked over to where Itachi was standing. The old Hokage picked up his pipe and then simply stated, follow me. Hiruzen then walked out of his office with the pipe in his mouth and Itachi in tow. The young clan head wondered why his liege wanted him to follow, but he did it silently. Hiruzen led Itachi out of the Hokage tower and through the streets of Kanoha. Itachi watched as Hiruzen would occasionally stop at a store and greet the owner or say hello to someone in the street. It took the duo almost an hour to make their way through Kanoha to the spot Hiruzen was leading them towards. To Itachi's surprise, Hiruzen had brought the duo to entrance of Rotten Brambles. Rotten Brambles was originally the location of Danzo's na headquarters and had been turned into a garbage dump after the traitor's execution. Hiruzen glanced over at his companion whose confusion for being here was obvious, even with how well-schooled Itachi's face was. No doubt you are wondering why I have brought you to this place and why I did so by such an indirect route. Itachi blinked his eyes once and then nodded his head. Such thoughts were in my mind. I do not doubt for a moment that you had a reason for doing this. However, I cannot find the key to solve this puzzle. Might I ask what I have failed to notice? A small smile appeared on the old leader's face when he heard Itachi's question. 
You don't know how much it pleases me Itachi that you recognize when something is outside your abilities and that you are willing to ask for aid. Far too many ninjas will not recognize their limits, or, if they do recognize said limits, they will refuse to ask for assistance. The key you are looking for is this. What is the difference between the Konoha that exists and the Konoha that might have been which this place represents? The young clan leader closed his eyes and thought about what Hiruzen say very carefully. After coming up with several differences between Hiruzen and Danzo's idea of Konoha, he relooked again for the core difference. Something in how the Hokage had spoken hinted that this core difference was the true key and not the simple surface differences that anyone could point out. For several minutes Itachi continued to think and examine the statement from every angle. Finally, Itachi opened his eyes and gave the Hokage his answer. The difference between the two Konohas is their view of violence and its place in life. Our Konoha accepts that violence is an unfortunate part of life. In turn, our Konoha takes this reasoning and has crafted its shinobi as fighters against violence. We seek to find the path of least bloodshed in war, and the path preserves peace when not at war. In essence, our Konoha is a shield that exists to allow other people to live peaceful lives. On the other hand, Danzo's Konoha embraces violence as a vital part of life. It would have taken this Risonian and would have forged its shinobi to be agents of conflict. Such a Konoha would have reveled in the carnage of war and would have sought to restore conflict in times of peace. Such a Konoha would be an altar to the evils within the human heart. Pirazin nodded his head and sighed. You understand Itachi. As ninjas, we have to tread in the shadows so that others may walk in the light. One could almost consider us to be protective shadows that are always with those who live peaceful lives. It was for just this reason that Harashirama initially chose the title Shadow of Fire when this village was founded. It was the daimyo of that time that altered the title Hokage, but the essence of the title's meaning has stayed the same. However, as shadows we risk straying too far from the light and becoming lost within the darkness that we deal with. Danzo and I were once very much alike when we were your age Itachi. Unfortunately, Danzo started to slip into the darkness of violence when the Nidame died. His inability to harmonize himself with his emotions lead to him losing the chance to become the Sandame Hokage and in turn lead him to squashing his emotions. Such an act made it easy for Danzo to become a monster because emotions are our tether to the light. We must feel remorse of the lives we extinguish, regret when a subordinate dies or is injured by our orders, joy when comrades return home safely from a dangerous mission, and rage when a close friend is killed. To do otherwise is unnatural and makes us less than human. Itachi nodded his head. I understand sir. If anyone in the village understood what Hiruzen was trying to get across, it was Itachi. The young Jonin had experienced the full gambit of emotions that a ninja would experience and had gone through missions that would have torn lesser men to shreds. Actually, Itachi was pretty sure that he would have been an emotional wreck if it hadn't been for his wife. AM had helped him cope and overcome the pains in his life by being a caring heart, an understanding ear, and sometimes just by letting him forget the pain in a frenzy coupling. Itachi knew he had gotten a lucky break when he married her, and he knew it was all because Naruto had once taken him there for lunch when he had been guarding the Namika's heir. The Hokage accepted Itachi's response and quietly pulled out a necklace with a small orange crystal. Hiruzen gently placed the necklace in his hand and then offered it to Itachi. This is the Yuzu necklace. It is the companion necklace to the Hokage necklace that is in Tsunade's possession. Both were made by the Yuzumaki clan when Mito Yuzumaki married Hirashirama Senju. Lady Mito gave this necklace to Tabarama as a symbol that he was Hirashirama's second. Tabarama in turn passed this necklace on to me after he became Hokage. I've handed this necklace out twice before to men who I deemed worthy of being my second. The first was Sakumo Haddock who returned the necklace to me when he felt that disgrace made him unworthy of the position it signified. The second person I gave this necklace to was Minato Namikaze. I now offer this to you and the position it signifies. Do you accept Itachi Ichiha the responsibilities of being the shadow heir? Itachi looked like an Akamichi had hit him with their fist while they were using their Bakai Jutsu. He, become the shadow heir. The irony of the situation was far too bittersweet for Itachi. His great-grandfather Madara had become a traitor because he had been the position of Hokage and had not even been considered for the post of shadow heir. His father had planned a coup because he had never received either position and had felt that a Senju flunky would always deny the Ichihas their rightful due. It was known throughout the village that Hiruzen's old teammates disliked if not downright detested the Ichiha clan. And yet, here he was being offered this position. Hiruzen nervously watched Itachi as the young man considered his offer. The old Hokage silently prayed that Itachi would accept the position. Hiruzen knew that his time had passed and that while he could continue as the Hokage for a little longer, a Godin would need to emerge soon. Itachi was the best person that Hiruzen could think of for the job. His own students had the power, but they were too trapped by the past and their personal flaws to guide Konoha in these changing times. 
A lot of the other jonins didn't have both the power and the vision to be entrusted with the mantle. Sure, some of them could perform the job if necessary, but Hiruzen didn't want to have a mediocre successor. The young Itachi had everything that Hiruzen was looking for in a successor. Itachi had experienced war, knew just how terrible such a tragic state was, and was determined to avoid another war if possible. He had the mind to grasp a complex situation and determine the best course of action that would achieve the mission goal without any more sacrifice than absolutely necessary. Trials and tribulations had tested the young man's resolve with him emerging stronger in the end, where far too many would break. Finally, he had the power and ability to command respect from his fellow Kanoha ninjas and fear from his enemies. Future enemies would be far more hesitant to fight Kanoha if the resolute justice was the Hokage instead of the aging god of Shinobi. Finally, Itachi reached out and took the necklace from Herzuin's hand. The new shadow heir then put on the necklace. I accept the position until you find someone better suited, or the day I have to take your position sir. Aichi woke on the couch in the living room of Naruto's house. The Iwajenin rubbed his neck to work out the kinks in it. Had they been staying at the Namika's compound, he could have had his own room to stay in. Unfortunately for Daichi, Team Marifugi was staying with Naruto in the house he had inherited from Kasumi. It was a very nice house, Daichi would give it that. However, it only had four bedrooms, and he was left with options of either bunking with Fubuki or the couch. Neither option appealed to Daichi, but at least the couch was quiet and didn't unleash a gas attack after eating fire country cuisine. The brains of Team Marifugi strolled over to the kitchen and grabbed a hot cup of tea. Daichi quickly drank his cup and smiled. Say what you will about these forest dwellers, but they sure knew how to make a tea that will wake you up in the morning. Now waking up, Daichi noticed that his host was working in the kitchen with a half dozen clones. Naruto smiled at his guest and called out, breakfast should be ready in a few minutes. You can use the hall bathroom to freshen up. Fubuki's already been in and Ryo stated that he was going to sleep in a bit. Daichi nodded his head and replied, okay. Uh, what about Asuka? I've been on missions with her before and I know that she can take forever to get ready. There was only one fault that all Kanoichis, even the good ones, had as far as Daichi was concerned, and that was that they in the end were girls. Not that there was anything particularly wrong with girls, but they took forever to get ready. At least with Asuka Team Marifugi didn't have to wait even longer for her to do her makeup like teams with fangirls did. The Iwajenin's musings were interrupted when Naruto yelled out to one of his clones. Hey Baka, don't go so skimpy on the hot sauce. Fubuki likes spicy foods, so make sure that is is extra hot. Naruto's clone quickly shot back, no backseat cooking dumbass. Besides, what kind of moron calls himself an idiot? Look in the mirror, Naruto muttered to himself before returning his attention to Daichi. Sorry about that, cage bunchins tend to get a little reckless and careless when I set them to domestic tasks. As one, the shadow clone shot back, no we don't. You just hate doing chores. The sweat drop formed on the back of Daichi's head as he watched Naruto argue with his cage bunchins. There was nothing more pitiful than watching a person lose an argument with himself. That Naruto was having an argument was with half a dozen copies of himself only made the situation all the more embarrassing. Daichi was so engrossed in the floor show that he missed his chance to take a shower and was brought out of his surprise by his teammates coming down for breakfast. Breakfast was an enjoyable meal for the five people. Naruto's clones had prepared something relatively light but still very energy-packed and delicious. It was the type of meal that all ninjas were used to having before going on duty. The five ninjas were sitting at the breakfast table with Naruto at the head, Asuka to his right, Ryo to his left, Fubuki next to Asuka, and Daichi next to Ryo. Fubuki spoke up towards the end of breakfast. So Naruto, I know we discussed a couple of strategies with your team yesterday. Is there any particular plan that you like the best? Naruto closed his eyes and sighed. He then opened them and glanced to Asuka. Personally I don't like this plan, but I must admit that trouble in paradise is our best option. It will allow us to hide our cooperation better than any other plan until it is too late for our opponents. The eldest and Jounin sibling nodded his head with a serious look on his face. Fubuki's usual joker persona had frozen to allow the team leader that he was to emerge into plain view. Alright, let's go over everyone's part just to make sure we all remember how we're supposed to act. Naruto, as far as everyone in the exam is concerned you've recently found out about the betrothal and you're annoyed because you had to your eye on a girl from Kanoha for some time. The only reason no one knows who this girl is because you wanted to prove that you were more than just your father's son before asking her out. Your teammate Shino doesn't need to act outside of his usual self. However, Ino is to play the part of the jealous stalker who was trying to worm her way into your heart. She'll need to act extremely hostile to Asuka, not cold shoulder hostile, but itching for a catfight hostile. Make sure that your teammates know their roles when they get to the academy. After Naruto nodded his head, Fubuki continued on stating what roles Team Marifugi needed to play. 
Asuka is to assume an ice bitch persona. As far as her role is concerned, Naruto is nothing more than an annoyance that she'll have to put up with. My role is that of the honor obsessive big brother. I will be constantly harping on you two for needing to stay together and fulfill the duties of the treaty. With my part, the fact that your parts hate their current situation is immaterial. Daichi, your role is to play the bitter comrade. While not in love with Asuka's character, your persona will be furious that the butcher's son has carried off a sign of a noble Iwa clan as a war trophy. Does everyone understand their roles? Then he Ashi met up at their usual training ground and then headed towards the academy. Along the way, Naruto briefed his teammates on their roles in Trouble in Paradise. Naruto paused when the trio got to the academy and he muttered to himself, okay. Let's get this show on the road. The Ashi students calmly made their way to the third floor, ignoring the faint Jinjutsu on the entrance to the second floor. Whoever got caught by that lame Jinjutsu should be sent back to the academy to learn how to be a ninja. It didn't even make you feel like you had gone up a second flight of stairs. The trio walked onto the third floor with Naruto a step ahead of his teammates. Ino was positioned to Naruto's right and Shino was walking by Naruto's left. To the team's surprise, their sensei was standing in front of the exam room calmly waiting for them. Hiyashi glanced at his students and nodded his head. It's good that all three of you are here as otherwise none of you could proceed with the test. I expect each and every one of you to bring honor to Konoha and your clans today with your progress in these tests. But that said Hiyashi let his team pass and left for the teacher's lounge that had been reserved for the Jonin teachers. The trio entered the waiting room and quickly noticed that they were one of the early arrivals. They then watched as a new team would arrive every couple of minutes. Suddenly, a host of teams started pouring through the door muttering about a Jinjutsu. Ino looked at the arriving ninjas and shook her head. I guess someone must have blabbed about the illusion cast on the second floor. Both Shino and Naruto nodded their heads. Shino then stated, it is likely that someone cancelled the illusion in order to showcase their abilities. Whoever did so is probably a green genin who is insecure about his or her abilities and was trying to enhance their self-image by making these ninjas look like fools. Such a ninja is most probably a minimal threat to us. Likewise, the ninjas in this current batch are likely to be less ready to become chunin than we were anticipating for our competition. As if to prove Shino's point, Team Hiyashi heard Shikamaru grumbling. Why do you always have to be so troublesome Sasuke? Things would have been so much simpler for us if you hadn't made the announcement about the Jinjutsu. Now we have more competitors to deal with. Diba added his own two cents before Sasu could respond. Oh shut up you lazy bum. So the jerk got us more competitors to trounce, I don't see what your problem is with this situation. Naruto quickly glanced at his teammates and whispered to them. I think it would be a good idea for us to move to another location. We wouldn't want Kiba's mouth to bring undue attention on us now would we? Unfortunately for Team Hiyashi, Kiba had already spotted them. The rambunctious Inuzuka quickly led his comrades over and called out, Hey Naruto. How's it hanging man? Can you believe that we're in the Chunin exams? Ino glanced at Naruto and motioned with her head towards Kiba. You were friends with this fleabag back in the academy. She then turned to Sasuke and Shikamaru. How do you put up with this smelly loudmouth? It must be terrible when you try to hide and have him giving away your location from a click away. Suddenly a new voice cut into the conversation. Shikamaru was talking to me the other day. He said that Kiba's been scheduled to have the problem fixed as soon as their sensei finds the time. The six rookies turned their heads to look at Choji, who was being followed by his teammates Sakura and Hinata. Kiba gave Choji a dark glare and muttered, that was cold man. The nine former classmates quickly started catching up with each other. While a few had hung out with each other, the nine hadn't been in one place together since their team assignments back in the academy. Naruto used the greetings to discreetly signal to Team Marifugi that it was time for the show to begin. He then began to glare at his fiancé's team and falling into part. Hinata noticed the unusual anger in her crush's face and meekly spoke up. Um Naruto, is everything alright? Naruto glanced at Hinata and gave her a weak smile. Things are tolerable. Let's leave it at that shall we? The Hyuga heiress didn't have time to respond because a new voice cut into the nine's conversations. Would you rookies please settle down? You're drawing too much attention to yourselves. As a fellow leaf ninja, let me assure you that attention is never a good thing. Everyone turned to look at the older Konoha ninja who had silver hair, round glasses, and was walking towards them. Sasuke gave the older ninja a distant look and said, just who are you to be telling us what to do? The older genin smiled and smoothly replied, my name is Kabuto Yakushi and I have participated in these exams several times. Shikamaru looked at Kabuto and asked, exactly how many times is several times? A slightly sheepish look came over Kabuto's face as he answered Shikamaru's question. This is actually my seventh time in the exams. You see, these exams test both your own skill and the skill of your teammates as you work with them to pass all of the exams. 
I failed my first three times because I focused too much on my medical studies and thus couldn't meet all of the requirements of the exam. My failures the last three times were because one of my teammates wasn't ready for the exam. Alas, that happens when you get moved onto new teams because your colleagues are more gifted than you. Naruto then decided to speak up. So Kabuto, what do you think your chances of passing this year are? Kabuto smiled at Naruto and promptly replied to the friendly question, pretty good actually. Both of my teammates have the skills needed to pass and we work together very well. Bearing rotten luck, we all should finally get those Junin jackets. Besides, Kabuto paused for a second to pull out a pack of cards, this time around I've got these. They're info cards that I've created from gathering as much data as I could on my competition. With these I'll know vital information on my opponents and be able to plan a strategy to defeat them. The older Genin smiled and then replied, tell you what. I'm in a good mood this time around, so I'll let each of you pick one ninja here and I'll share what I've gathered on the person. Consider it a little extra leverage between comrades. After all, we wouldn't want these foreign ninjas to show us up in our own village, now would we? Hanada quickly spoke up, would you mind telling us what your card says on Naruto? The Hyuga heiress quickly noticed that several of her former classmates were throwing her some odd looks. She then quickly and politely defended her actions. I wanted to see how well Yakushi's information was. The Budo shrugged his shoulders and quickly replied, that's perfectly understandable ma'am. Now, where did I? Ah, here's Naruto's card. Let's take a look shall we? Name? Naruto Namikas. Age? 14. Parents? Minato Namikas, Yandame Hokage, deceased, and Kashina Namikas, formerly of Yuzu, deceased. Allegiance. Kanoha. Teammates. Shino Abura and Ino Yamanaka with Hiyashi Hayuga. Mission history. 2C rank missions and 20D rank missions. Abilities. Competent in all ninja skills with a specialty for Bajutsu, Ninjutsu, and Fuinjutsu. Note. Betrothed to Asuka Tinjaun and Iwa since birth. Team Zenoichi and Itachi let out a shocked cry of surprise when they heard the note on Kabuto's info card. Kiba started scratching his head and then blurted out, okay Kabuto's info card suck. I mean come on. There is no chance at all that Naruto really is engaged. Fall into character, Naruto sent Kiba and Kabuto a dangerous glare. Thank you two so much for reminding me. I was trying to forget about that little arrangement during the exam. Sakura blinked her eyes and then asked, so what Kabuto told us was true. How did that happen? I mean, how could you have been engaged since birth when your parents died when you were born? Naruto sighed and then answered his comrade. It was part of the treaty to end the last war. Because of some backroom dealing, I've ended up with her, at this Naruto pointed to where Asuka was standing, as my future wife. If my father was still alive I'd beat him black and blue for doing this to me. Everyone turned to look at Asuka and her comrades. Kiba gave Asuka a quick glance over and then let out a wolf whistle. Damn Naruto, you're one lucky son of a bitch. I wish that my old man had arranged for me to get such a hot eye before he kicked the bucket. The girls in the group didn't get the chance to pulverize Kiba for his crass behavior as Asuka moved forward with her part of the drama. She calmly walked over to the ten Kanoha genin and discreetly cast a minor Jinjutsu to enhance her icy persona. Asuka gave the Inuzuka a distant look and then turned her attention to Naruto. Must you associate yourself with such insignificant insects? Even a rodent like yourself can do better than these vermin. Naruto equaled his betrothed acting skills as she shot back, don't refer to my friends as vermin. Besides, why the hell does it matter who I hang out with? Asuka fortified herself for the next round of barbs she needed to unleash for the play. She scoffed at Naruto's reply and shrugged her shoulders. It matters because my uncle was a fool to think that you had something that was worth being tied to my illustrious clan. The shame of having to be associated with you is barely bearable, but associating with trash like this would make the situation intolerable. If you really must continue to associate with these weaklings, then do me a favor and get yourself killed in this exam so that I will no longer have to put up with this inconvenience. Ibuki's character then stepped foot on the stage by placing a hand firmly on Asuka's shoulder. In a firm voice he commanded, that is enough sister. You are never to speak that way about your betrothed again. Our uncle made this arraignment on behalf of our clan and you will honor it. The reputation of our clan demands no less than that. With that, the Tinjaun and siblings returned to stand by Daichi, feeling that they had accomplished the goal of trouble in paradise. Kiba gave Naruto a mournful look and shook his head. Naruto, I take back everything I just said. What the hell did you do in your past life to merit being shackled to such a bitch? The young Namikas wasn't able to answer the Inuzuka because a Chunin came into the room and announced that the exams were about to begin. Ibiki Marino had to fight the urge to shake his head in frustration and annoyance. Could these Chunin wannabes possibly be any more obvious in their cheating? For example, did that girl on Guy's team really think that they hadn't noticed her putting the mirror up on the roof? 
another prime example of these genin's lack of stealth was the Hyugas. Did those two really think that no one had noticed that they had activated their Keke Genkai? Guy's pupil was on her last chance, and the Hyugas had lost three of their five opportunities to gather information. Personally Ibiki wanted to fail the entire lot for being caught once. After all, if you're caught on an actual mission then you and your team are dead. However, the Chunin exam board had ruled that the information gathering test would be passable if the ninja in question displayed acceptable levels of competency. Their definition of competency was showing abilities that could be successfully used in the field with minimal amount of detection by an unaware enemy. The fact that most of said abilities were entirely inappropriate for this kind of information gathering was ignored by the board. Thus, Ibiki and his fellow examiners had to turn a blind eye towards most ninja actions. They could only boot someone out if they messed up or were simply too sloppy. The no has top interrogator knew how everyone in the exam was gathering their information except for six people. Team Marifugi hadn't attempted to use any of Iwa's normal information gathering methods. Ibiki knew that because they didn't have anything on their papers. The other three people he was puzzled about were on Team Hiashi. No bugs were flying around to single that the Aburum was gathering info, and the Yamanaka was positioned in the front row, unable to use her clan jutsus. What was going through the minds of those six? For a moment, Ibiki considered the possibility that they had figured out the hidden loophole in the rules and were just going to pass on raw courage. However, that was a remote possibility as such a move would require them to know about the final part of the test. Why was he worried about what the brats were doing in the first place? After all, it was no skin off his nose if they passed or not. Ibiki felt a headache building as he continued to think of the situation with the six. He could feel in his gut that something was off about the two teams. Why was it that the two teams had a rather heated confrontation in the lobby and now they were acting so much alike? Was it merely coincidence? Ibiki held off a scoff. If it was coincidence then he was the shod eye of the village hidden in absurdity. Suddenly a glint of light caught Ibiki's eyes and directed their attention to Daichi's left arm. The Iwa ninja had the arm lazily hanging by his side with two small wires coming out of his sleeve. Ibiki quickly traced the paths of the two wires, now that he knew that they existed. One wire went to Daichi's right where it stopped at Ino's feet and then went straight back towards Fubuki. The other wire headed behind Daichi to Naruto and then went to the Namikaze's right to link up with Fubuki. The two wires then headed to Fubuki's right where they came to Shino. From Shino, the wires went down the road to Asuka. Small pulses of chakra were constantly traveling through the wire. Why, those clever little bastards Ibiki stated to himself in his head. The six were using the wire messaging technique. It was a technique that allowed forces to communicate through chakra pulses sent through a wire. Most ninjas didn't use the jutsu because it required fine chakra control, was tricky to set the wire up, the wire could be cut at any point, and anyone who touched the wire could listen in on the conversation. Ibiki didn't take any points off of the six, even though he had caught them obviously coordinating a plan to get information by some as yet unrevealed method. It was clear to him now that the six had been staging the earlier confrontation in order to throw off anyone's suspicion of them working together. The fact that they had somehow passed the wire around, probably with a variation of the Kugutsu Jutsu, without anyone noticing, showed a greater deal of skill than the average Junin. Hell, the only reason that they had been discovered was the fact that he was a paranoid bastard who knew that they had to be cheating somehow. The interrogator turn exam giver didn't have to wait long to find out what the six were planning. A series of smoke bombs suddenly went off covering the entire classroom in smoke. Screams of surprise and indignation filled the rooms as the Genins and Chunins tried to react to this unexpected attack. Ibiki crouched down behind his desk and carefully scanned the classroom. The thick smoke made it hard to see, but he could make out the forms of people standing next to the desks of the wannabes. It quickly became obvious to Ibiki that the figures were clones of some type, since they all looked like him. His lookalikes were all busy trying to steal everyone's tests, and the students were busy trying to protect their papers. A few of the Chunin observers were about to intercept the clones, but Ibiki signaled them to move back. This was an unexpected situation, and he wanted to see how the Genin would react. Most of the examinees were able to protect their papers while a couple had their papers stolen. Eventually, all of the clones were destroyed, and Ibiki decided it was time to bring back the fear of the Kami into these brats. If I ever find who pulled this catastrophe I'll use them as the new tea and I practice dummy. To emphasize this, Ibiki poured all of his killing intent into his sentence, causing several genin to wet themselves in fear. He then glanced at the Chunin examiners and called out, everyone who lost their papers or couldn't hold their bladders is removed from the exam. We don't need ninjas who cannot protect vital documents or remember when to go to the bathroom. Ibiki used the removal of the incompetent as a chance to glance at teams Hiyashi and Marifugi. Each of the six ninjas had a complete test with their names on it lying on their desks. Ibiki couldn't help himself, and he cracked a small grin as he looked at the six. 
They had used the commotion of the smoke bombs and clone attack to swap their tests for ones that had the complete answers. What a brilliantly coordinated effort at information gathering. The best part of it was that it pulled off the illusion that their attempt to collect the papers had failed when the clones were destroyed and no one could prove that they did anything. Dean Hiashi walked a few feet away from the entrance to training ground 44 and looked around. After checking to make sure that the coast was clear Naruto spoke up. Alright, let's go get our partners. Naruto then pulled out a scroll from his pocket and unrolled it on the ground. His teammates didn't look at the seals written on the inside of the scroll because they knew it was way over their heads. The young Namakas placed his hand on a hand outline on the scroll and called out, ally summoning technique. Activate. Three columns of smoke popped out of the scroll and then Team Marifugi appeared standing on the scroll. Fubuki scratched the back of his neck and then muttered, man that was weird. I vote that the next time we have to work together that you're the one summoned. Naruto just shook his head. Technically, I didn't summon you three. The seal array on the scroll summoned the tags that I gave you before we left my house. You three simply piggybacked with the tags as they were summoned. But enough of basic few ninjutsu principles, we've got five days to get two more scrolls and make it to the tower at the center of the training ground. Aichi, who was holding his team scroll, glanced about at Team Hiashi. He then stated as he stepped off the summoning scroll, we've got heaven. Ino nodded her head and replied, same here. It looks like we'll need two earth scrolls. Asuka was the last member of her team to step off the scroll and allow Naruto to roll it back up. She then glanced at Shino and stated, am I correct in assuming that you'll be directing us to our first enemy team? Shino nodded his head. I was able to plant a kikai on all the other teams while Ms. Mitarashi was explaining this test. The nearest target is approximately 100 meters to our right. Naruto merely grinned and spoke up. Well, what are we waiting for? We outnumber them two to one and we know where they are. All we have to do is ambush them and move on to the next opponent before we head to the tower. The six ninjas quickly followed Shino until they ran into a team from Taki. Both teams were currently hiding in the tree branches, silently watching the Taki ninjas bumble about through the forest. A strong but thin wire connected all six so that they could use the wire messaging technique. Naruto sent out, OK here's our target. What's our plan of attack and it better not be a frontal assault. We need to save our strength in case our next enemy is better than these three. Yubuki quickly responded, that's obvious bro to be. Of course, I doubt that any team could possibly be worse than these three in the field. Asuka entered the conversation. I suggest that I put a Jinjutsu on them to think that they're under attack. That could direct them to a spot where we can then ambush them. Aichi got on the line. I'll take care of the ambush part. Close quarters is my specialty after all. Naruto nodded his head as he listened to the conversation. Good, that's a very good plan. However, I suggest that we modify it slightly with Ino in a sniper position to take out anyone that Daichi can't easily get to. What poisons do you have on hand Ino? I've got paralysis poisons and some neurotoxins Naruto. Which do you think I should use? The young Namakas closed his eyes and thought for a second. He then sighed and gave his answer. Better make it the neurotoxin Ino. We can't use short paralysis or they might attack us and longer paralysis poisons would leave them defenseless to the predators roaming this forest. A quick and painless death is the most merciful option we've under these circumstances. But the plan decided on, the six quickly went to work. Daichi quickly moved to hide in a bush near the Taki ninjas. Ino took to a tree branch several meters in front of Daichi and coated her senbin needles in the fastest acting poison in her kit. Asuka maneuvered herself into a position to better cast the Jinjutsu. Finally, the three remaining shinobi took supporting positions in the tree canopy so that they could jump in if things went sour. Asuka quickly cast her Jinjutsu, and everyone watched as the Taki ninjas reacted to an unseen assault. The Tinjoun and Eris quickly corralled her enemies and directed towards the bush Daichi was hiding in. Daichi waited until his enemies were close enough, and then he struck. His hands shot out to the bush towards the two closet ninjas slamming into their backs. This activated the two hidden blades on his wrists, quickly came out of concealment and embedded themselves into his opponents. Both blades cut straight through the ninja's spines and pierced their hearts killing both in an instant. The Taki ninja farthest from Daichi spotted the attack and tried to run away. Unfortunately for him, Ino quickly threw a senbin that pierced his jugular vein, allowing the neurotoxin to enter his system. Naruto, Shino, and Fubuki quickly dropped out of the canopy and approached the deceased ninjas. They then quickly rummaged through the bodies until Shino found the scroll that they were carrying. He gave it a quick glance and simply stated, it's an earth scroll. Naruto nodded his head and pulled out a blank scroll. He then opened it and rapidly started inscribing it with seals. Okay Shino, just give me a moment and then we can move on to our next target. Naruto then set the scroll down and placed the Taki ninja's bodies on it before calling out, seal. There were several puffs of smoke as the three bodies were sealed into the scroll. 
Asuka gave her Bethra the questioning glance and then asked, Anaruto. Why did you seal those bodies in that scroll? Naruto simply shrugged his shoulders and replied so that they could be returned to their families after the exams are over. I figure that it will be hard enough on their families to have the three die in these exams. There's no need to make it any harder by leaving their bodies for the predators when it's no trouble to bring them along like this. A faint blush appeared on Asuka's face as the six headed out. It was touching that even in an exam like this Naruto was concerned for his enemies. Most ninjas, herself included, wouldn't have bothered themselves with what could happen to an enemy team or what their families would feel.